Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, they decent gentle thems. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Das Glide Radio. Hosted by yours truly, the fluid yet static, stoic yet spirited, and always welcoming Everett J. Blackwell. Now I'm just jumping in here ahead of the usual skits at the beginning of our video to introduce a new segment here at Dusklad for those with a binging spirit. Stories from Sturgeon, Volume 1. If you don't already know or you're new to the channel, Sturgeon is the wonderful place we broadcast from here at Dusklad Radio. It is home to the spaces in between, the last sin eater Nell Lockwood, the tortoise Malachi that produces strange tarot cards, the mysterious Mantis Bay, and the Nightmare Fighting Tournament, among many other popular destinations and peoples. If you don't know of those, well, you've got some links in the description to follow to Dark Somnium, Spirit Voices, and Romnex, among many others. Over 3.5 million souls have ventured to Sturgeon's borders in the past four years, and we're opening ourselves some more tourism. This compilation is a series of single-part stories that delve into the bizarre, horrifying, and spine-tingling experiences some Sturgeon residents have experienced and brought into our studio, all in a near five-hour mix for you. If you enjoy the vibes we put out, the voice acting and the sound design on display, and the general content, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell for more. We have a weekly Monster of the Week show in Sturgeon going out known as the Nightmare Detectives and two other kinds of narrations each week. If you're feeling real generous, our Patreon is in the description below, but we're grateful for any kind of support. With that, I'll hand it on over to Everett from the past to do the usual transmissions. As always, dear listeners, it is a pleasure to broadcast for you. Raise a purple crayon for me and for our janitor. Take care. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle thems. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, iridescent, infinitesimal Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us Blackwells. Are we were the campaign managers for Sturgeon's first elected nightmare politician, the Bendy Man. Now that name didn't go down so well, it connoted unpleasant memories of his past role within our community. Back when Sturgeon was just a loose collective of villages and the Bendy Man demanded tribute so as not to recruit more of our young to his brood. So in a modern day, we gave him a modern title, Mr. Benz. His policy was that of unity between the two sides of Sturgeon, namely the normal, blighted humans on one side and the nightmare folklore district on the other that are traditionally kept separate in most instances for everyone's protection. Though the blighted members of Sturgeon can cross over and usually inhabit job roles look after everyone now. For example, following Mr. Benz's election, Sturgeon started to expand its infrastructure. Now we have a bar called The Spaces In Between that caters to all in exchange for stories rather than payment. Then we've got the Hotel Inertia, a place of innumerable floors housing unique desires and locales on each one. A mortuary clinic called Death May Die that specifically looks after folklore creatures and gives them proper burial rites. We even have the Lockwood and McGraw Nightmare Detective Agency to investigate any crimes committed by or against nightmares and folklores. All things that were made possible by Mr. Benz. His slogan was great. Together, we are strong. Apart, we are little more than mewling whelps in the blackness, defenseless, and waiting to be taken by the things that move unseen. We do not want to attract their attention, so please, citizens, huddle under my guiding light. He got elected six times. Total landslide. If you're just joining us, first of all, welcome and do not skip. I promise each of these are unique in their own way. We don't form pacts with barons of hell that involve a sacrifice of creepy Catholics in exchange for funny anecdotes for nothing, you know? Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some will force you to uproot your entire life. You decided to do this long ago, 
the songs on the radio constantly talking about how they hated their hometown and that it was so washed up and emboldened you, but you never took it to heart. That is, until you saw them. They didn't see you. Not at first, anyway. But as time went on, they caught sight of you and they never stopped seeing you. You were attracted to something within them. Not just on the surface, but something special about them. You could never put your finger on it, but it was inescapable to you. When they got on that boat, you eagerly followed, hiding yourself in the cargo and listening out for their footsteps. You were always good at knowing whose footsteps were whose. And theirs were soft, delicate, and well-intentioned. When you saw a light again, it was underneath a black sun that bathed the surrounding buildings in twilight. A mixture of lavender and crimson stained the skyline, and everyone on the docks was grabbing at their heads with orgasmic smiles. Except them. They were staring right at you with their jaw slack. You shouldn't be here, they breathed. They were right. You shouldn't. But the story led you here. And as you gazed at what moved behind the black sun, you realized that it was here you would stay. It's time to introduce our story for this evening. The story, titled I Was Just Told the Three Words You Never Want to Hear, comes to us from... <sighs> really? It comes to us from head custodian, apparently he got a promotion, T.J. Lee, who will also be pulling double duty as our narrator. TJ has attached a note to the transcript, informing everyone that this is another story from Sturgeon, and as we delve further into the world he has transcribed for us, the playlists will be made longer. But for those who are unfamiliar, they can dive in at the reading guide linked below. TJ's actually still wiping Max's blood off the window and bouncing on his toes and licking some of the blood off the window. Hmm. I don't think it empowers him, but I'm not entirely sure what does since TJ never leaves the station. If you like TJ's work here or elsewhere, be sure to show him some love over on Twitter at TJ Lee, his subreddit r slash TJ Lee, his podcast, The Writer's Mythos, where he looks into the untold tales of the world's most famous horror writers, and if you somehow have time, consider pre-ordering his first novella in the Chronicles of Sturgeon, The Last Sin Eater as adapted by The Amazing Romnex on YouTube, releasing May 7th in Kindle and Paperback. All linked below. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dusklight Bowser, the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head for allowing Dusklight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. And, of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear is provided by the Dark Somnium. With gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. You ever hear about Delta P? I bristle from behind my magazine at the voice cutting the silence in the waiting room. I turned to see a middle-aged man who had taken a seat on the other side of the wall. A little too far down to make out features, but his suit was hard to ignore. Pinstripe grey, oversized and with big frayed holes all across it, like he'd been in some kind of accident. The sun was shoddily patched up with mismatched material giving him a bit of a vagrant look. I double took and thought he'd been seriously injured, but when my eyes adjusted, I couldn't see any at this distance. His leg bounced in place as he leaned his head over, draping it on his shoulder and staring at me. Hands clasped together and asked it again in the exact same intonation when it didn't respond quick enough. You ever hear about Delta P? 
I feel the distinct sensation of being eyed up. But I play along. No? What is it? He drapes his arms over his knees and casts his head up, looking up at the clock in the waiting room as he speaks again. It's a pressure shift in a pipe when liquid is passing through. You can't tell it's there until something happens. Usually catastrophic damage to anything passing by. You ever see that video of a crab walking along a pipe just before it vanishes? The side of his lips curl into a grin when I realize I had. It was fascinating, but gruesome. Well, it's that. Plenty of men and women have been caught against Delta P. Their bodies ripped to shreds. A small mass the size of that clock face destroys their organs and expels them out to sea. Makes you think, don't it? I stare for a moment before applying, unsure of how social etiquette came into play when dealing with someone weird. But where I come from, manners are important, so I humor him, electing to focus on my magazine while I reply, as meeting his gaze just hurt my eyes under the fluorescent lights. Think about what, exactly? His chair creaks as he replies, a confidence now oozing through his words. How similar our situation is to theirs. Awaiting a scan amid fears of something small, maybe no bigger than a watch face. Tearing our insides to shreds and infecting our organs. All things have a purpose, I suppose. I admit the conversation was taking my mind off my own anxieties, so I decided to press a little. You're talking about the butterfly effect, right? The idea that a butterfly's wings flap in one town and cause a hurricane in another. He laughed, a horrid, choking sound that seemed to lodge in his throat and never escape past his lips, something trapped there that he fed on. <laughs> it's never quite that pronounced, kid. More so that every decision you make is already leading you to where you'll ultimately end up. This depends on what state you end up there in. But you're the sort that makes careful decisions, I can tell. I look up from my magazine and he's moved a few seats down, some ten feet away now. His features are coming into place a little bit more, slicked back grey hair with a patch missing where his skull was dented in, old stitches littering the fragile skin like staples on paper. His eyes, there's something wrong with them. But the moment my brain tries to process what it is, it simply diverts to something else, as if there's an instinctive trigger in me to avoid it. What are you in for? I ask, trying to keep my nerve. Not exactly scared, but definitely feeling uneasy. A mounting sensation of concern that hadn't hit critical mass. He held up a hand and lightly slapped his opened jaw, creating a popping sound over and over each intonation getting lower in pitch. What the fuck was wrong with this guy? He stopped, shook his head, and pointed a long index finger at his patchwork suit affirmatively. I'm the mayor. They got me in for a routine check. Nothing quite like you, I'm afraid, son. The realization of this man not being all there and the two of us on our own in this waiting room was beginning to sink in. But I found myself unable to stop talking with him. The mayor of where? What do you mean, not like me? I'm, I'm also in for a routine check. He shook his head and tutted. Again, he did this incessantly, each tut growing lower and slower as his good eye fixed on me. I swear that if I looked long enough, the pupil was growing larger, more dilated. You know of the trolley problem, Stanley? He asked, ignoring my questions entirely and immediately setting me on edge. My jaw fell slack at the mention of my name and he smiled wide. So you have heard of it? I swallowed, the lights now burning my eyes and giving that strange sensation their dimming. Was I even blinking now? I couldn't be sure. It's the idea of putting your shopping trolley away, doing a selfless act for no expectation of gratitude, praise, or good deeds. It's a test of someone's character. 
His smile doesn't meet his eyes. He takes another seat down, and now he's almost directly opposite me. Ah, you're talking about the shopping cart. I was referring to the trolley problem. A situation wherein you can call a lot of people or just on one. Do you take everyone else with you or just a single soul? Really tells you about a man based on what he does with that given information. He clicks his tongue and looks me up and down. Right age, right life. You could have done so much if you'd just taken a few steps to your left instead of your right. <laughs> ah, well, maybe something will change your mind. I make a move to stand up, now feeling very much unsafe. Before I can even say, excuse me, and will my legs into lifting my body, he puts a hand on my knee. Absolutely no force or tension, but his sheer touch overpowers me. Now, now, you don't treat a new friend that coldly, let alone a mayor. We're not done yet, so hold your nerve for me. All I'm doing is asking you some questions, friend. His voice drops, and the pleasantries fade away for just a moment. So do me a kindness and answer them properly. As he gripped me, I could feel the malice running through his veins, and I made the mistake my instincts had been screaming not to. I focused on his eyes. It was impossible not to see the hazel eyes pupil growing wider and wider, slowly encompassing the entirety of his eyeball, the milky eye simply swiveling lazily. In that moment of absolute fear, I knew exactly what it reminded me of. A predator getting ready to pounce. Where... <clears throat> Where did you say you were the mayor of? I choked, trying to get my composure under control, hoping if I could keep him calm, he wouldn't hurt me. He was so close that even if I yelled out, nobody would get to me before he did damage, and we've all seen what nutjobs can do, given the opportunity. He cocked his head to the side, grinning. Were his teeth always that far apart? Small gaps dotted between each incisor, and black gums festered underneath. I didn't. It's a wonderful place that it changed you for the better, though. Oh, we have all sorts of facilities designed to test our citizens' limits and make them into better people. We take them from the brink of death and give them new life. Hotels, bars, think tanks, circuses, you name it. You see, everyone in my town, whether they know it or not, are the sorts of people who deviated from their path took a few steps left instead of right, said no to some arrangements and yes to others. Eventually, broken and destitute, they all wind up in my homestead with something they need. The air felt hot around us, and the surrounding scenery danced in that heatwave manner you see on the sidewalk outside. You will too, you know as will your family. My headache grew in intensity, the words seeping into my skull and adding to a swirling rush of blood threatening to make me puke from the intense, crushing feeling. I put up a hand to clutch my head, but again he grabbed me. Shh. Not yet, Stanley. I'm almost done. You asked me where I was mayor? An old Samson Carstairs isn't the type to refuse a request of information from a potential citizen. You passed all my tests with flying colors, and when you step into that office, your true journey will begin. I hope you'll join us when the time is right. A town like Sturgeon really could use a person of your skills. I hear you're most gifted at finding people who don't want to be found. I wish you luck, son. Sturgeon? Where had I heard? But I want you to listen closely to these words, boy. When you know what they mean, you'll know where to go. He let go and leaned in, a fervent whisper in his voice as he uttered just three last words. 
For as long as I live, I will never forget that expression. His teeth pushed further apart. The black mass on his gums bubbled, and I swear to God, I saw something in the back of his throat. Just for a moment. Not one. Two. Stop it! I finally bellowed, standing up in a fury with a burst of energy. The heat around me dissipated, and I was breathing heavily. Uh, Mr. Mikulski? The nurse looked over, concern riddled across his face as I did a double take. There was nobody sitting in the room with me. After the scan was complete, I was asked to wait in the doctor's office. Some 15 minutes went by before he and the consultant sat down, grim-faced. It's a benign tumor, Mr. Mikulski. It'd explain your headaches, blackouts, and any, uh... He pauses, shifting uncomfortably as he looks at the notes, obviously trying to be delicate. Incidents of hallucinations one would understandably experience. We could schedule in surgery if all goes well. It should fix the problem in due course. You're just lucky that you didn't take any longer. It could have been an even bigger problem. Guess it's a right place, right time kind of situation, huh? The consultant ran me through the procedure, the percentage rate of outside issues and so forth, but I remained in a fugue state for so much of it. I was healthy, I didn't smoke, drink, hurt anyone else, or do anything to damage my body. But I was still stricken with this thing in my head. Even more so, it made the old guy's questions all the more bizarre. Like he knew something I didn't. And it was on reflection of this a couple nights ago that a black envelope was placed under my door. My wife handed it to me with a look of bemusement on her face. Maybe it's from your cousin? She said, kissing me on the cheek before making us some dinner. Who, Eleanor? No, she's not the familial type. I smiled wistfully. We had a lot of fond memories growing up before she was taken in by her grandparents. As I opened it, my eyes widened and a myriad of concerns ran through my brain. Chief of all that was the mayor's grin. Honey, where did Nell move to a while back? I asked, my hands shaking and the feeling of sickness rushing through my stomach. I think it was some town called Sturgeon. Why? The flashes of the old man ran through my head and the way he described the town as a place where people deviated from their path to get something they needed. A fresh wave of sickness and fear enveloped me as I cast my eyes down to the open contents of the envelope. It was an application form for citizenship to Sturgeon, pre-approved. Beneath was a copy of my scan and a post-it note attached and signed by the mayor, confirming my worst fears as I saw the white masses in my skull. One that the doctors had obviously missed. One that looked large and imposing in comparison. My head swelled, and amid the questions of hallucinations and borderline madness, all I could think of was those prophetic words the old man had whispered with a smile before I went in for my scan. Not one. Two. Who'd have thought that we'd have a tale about not only our wonderful eternal Mayor Carstairs, but some new information about one of Sturgeon's greatest warriors in Madame Nell Lockwood. If you don't know who she is yet, don't worry, you will soon. I don't know about y'all, but the three words I wouldn't want to hear are you're not undead. Can you imagine how much boring living activities I'd have to take up again? Like exercise, sneezing, haircuts. Oh, that's the one perk of being half-dead. Not decaying to a point of absolute grossness, still hot enough to pass for alive, and a low-maintenance look to boot. It ain't all that bad. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly, and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of suffering, it's just a normal bell, but adding stuff like that is nice, and leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. We love fan art at Dusklight, and it warms my black heart to see it. We also love dedication, and dedication needs to be rewarded. And we want to thank more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time, we give thanks to Lady Nevermore, Changeling, Tragic Slayer, and Stephen Stevens, all hail the Ferret Queen indeed, for giving us their valuable time. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of YouTube. 
infecting the airways with our intoxicating presence. When we hit 500 subs, we've got something wonderful planned. And one last time, listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them, Dusk Glide will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a nature documentary, eat some takeout, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow. You matter. You are loved. Every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle thems. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio. Hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, infinitesimal, truly magnificent, flamboyant, Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us. We were known for our world-famous publishing house, the Blackwell Epitaph. It was during the Victorian age and people loved the morbidity. And then we branched out into journalism and print. They especially loved it when we'd print things that hadn't yet come to pass. You see, the epitaph was a unique way to report on both the human and nightmare ongoings. Most folks back then were entirely ignorant to that section of the community and the ways in which they died. A lot of folks just had this assumption that their inner body split the skin when nobody was looking and then pranced off into the obsidian woods from which no mortal soul returns. We felt it prudent to open folks up to new opportunities of life. We also produced fun puzzle games and ciphers, usually sent in by nice, well-meaning folks who elected to remain mysterious. One gentleman using the pseudonym Chet Bruce said he'd been hunting down ne'er-do-wells for as long as he could remember and wouldn't stop until the strange Cadillac ciphers were resolved. For three years, he ran roughshod on our little community, and we kept on publishing them, hoping someone would figure it out. Well, someone did. A senior nightmare biology student by the name of Thala McNamara figured it out over her morning eggs and toast. She said the council of spiders she houses told her the secrets and within 24 hours, Chet Bruce was caught. No more monstrosities on the streets. Well, at least the ones perpetuated by him. We foreclosed the epitaph as the Sturgeon Nexus gained traction with its more off-the-wall publications. They talk freely about the more underground dealings of Sturgeon's undesirables, and they feared no retribution. They also had a far more diverse staffing group by the turn of the century, and the epitaph went the way of the sandpit chameleon, tail up and rotten to the core. Still, there's always blogs. Maybe we can revive it in one manner or another, hmm? Could call it the Blackwell Resurrection. If it is joining us, first of all, welcome and do not skip, I promise each of these are unique in their own way. We don't command legions of tiny insects to crawl into your ears and whisper words of encouragement for nothing, you know. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, And some will force you to take up a job working for the farmers. We all know about the Sturgeon Farmers Collective, and soon, very soon, you will too. Someone over at the Sturgeon Nexus did an expose on them recently, and uh, it weren't pretty. The Farmers Collective is a shadowy cabal of individuals who never take their hoods off, appear at the doors of the simple villages in Mantis Bay, and offer strange meat in exchange for their next harvest, and refuse to divulge just what it is they're putting in the ground to help engorge the crops, or to tell the farmers what lays in the pods they haul away come spring. You don't want to work for the farmers, listener, but the story implores that you do so. It warns that if you do not, someone else you love dearly will have to do, and, well, they're not as qualified or as alert as you, and you wouldn't want them to succumb to the influence of the farmers now, would you? Of course not, or you'd never see that smile again once the eponymous hood is placed during graduation. 
Your role with the farmers is tenuous at best. You are an intern that they don't fully trust, but you will survey all the food coming in and ensure it is primed and ready for distribution. You want to know why it smells of formaldehyde and stale earth, but you do not get an answer. The story tells you to stay late one night, and you hear some key words during a company meeting. Cultivate, harvest, subjugate, control, and hunger. You don't know why these words upset you. They are, of course, normal buzz phrases for the Farmers Collective, but the way they groan as they say them sets your teeth chattering. Since you went home, all you see when you look at the big food companies is wrong. You know what each one contains, and you are unable to tell anyone. Because how would they believe you? How could they believe you? Aside from us at this station, of course. You now eat unmarked food and stare out of your one uncovered window, hoping the men from the Farmers Collective will stop swaying in the wind on your front yard. They know you have to come out eventually, listener. You'll run out of food eventually. Hunger will drive you to them. Or to do terrible things. Terrible, hunger-induced things. The Sturgeon Farmers Collective is counting on it. It's time to introduce our next story for this evening. It's entitled, There is a Person at Your Front Door. Which, if you're an anxiety-riddled person like me, is scary in itself. And it's another entry from our head custodian, T.J. Lee, who wants you all to know that this is another addition in the Sturgeon universe, though he's not sure it matters too much for enjoyment. I haven't seen much of TJ in the past week or so, you know. He started stockpiling his purple crayons and dish rags in his commune, and he started building and expanding within. I went to check on him last weekend and found him hunched over, making a purple crayon wife and child, and talking to him. Said Mr. Blackwell would find out eventually, and... TJ would be sent to a new HR person, that he didn't know what would happen if that occurred. I tried prompting him, but he hissed at me and said something that made my nose bleed. As I backed away and shut the door, I could have sworn the crayon wife turned her head to look at me. You can find more about TJ over at his subreddit r slash TJ Lee, his Twitter, at TJ Lee, and of course, his historical writers podcast, The Writer's Mythos, which debuts its next episode on Wednesday. He scribbled the title all over the walls of my office so I don't forget it. Either that or it's a bit of a veiled threat. Are you afraid of the dark? When I turn off the lights, some of the letters are in the usual purple. Others are in a deep glowing red that makes my ears ring if I look at it too long. Hmm. Special thanks must be given first to Mandemo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dustlight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dustlight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. Our cast today features our chaotic, evil, purple crayon eater T.J. Lee. All hail his janitorial wisdom. And of course, let's me forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping the sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. Ugh, seriously? Again? I grimaced as the phone rumbled, turning over in my bed to look at the sleep cycle clock as I pulled my phone closer to my face. 3.02 a.m. Cloudy outside. No breeze. Fucking Christ. I've barely slept. I live in a suburbia part of the town. We usually get drunken asshats who forget to look for common identifiers of their homes and just ring their doorbells expecting a roommate, spouse, or family member to let them in. Sometimes it's a prank spurred on by bored and or drunk teenagers during the spring break period. And occasionally, just every now and then, it's something else. My condo has a large set of steps going up to the property. Wooden decking with various bits of furniture including a hammock and some ornamental birds adorning it. 
my prized blue flamingo Barry sits in just the view of the doorbell camera, a trusty guard if there ever was one. The reason I got the damn camera installed was because of Barry, funnily enough. I don't know if it's wildlife or just some asshole, but someone pulled him from his perch and threw him into the bushes in my yard, scratching at his paint and going for the eyes. I figured it may have been someone looking to case the area and trial a scene to see if I reacted, but I'm a heavy sleeper most nights, so the camera was a good decision. Keeping one eye closed so I could go back to sleep after inspecting the camera, I flipped it open to the app. I have one of those Nest Hello cameras, and they got some crazy field of vision and work well in the daylight. Even if the nighttime view on mine is a little grainy at times, and some weird screen tearing happens every now and then when I look at the footage, I have no idea why. I look at the screen, and sure enough, nothing's out of place. The furniture is still there, hammock is swinging, and Barry is staring dutifully at the door. I'm about to close the app and curse some weird glitch for waking me when it hits me and my sleepy eye snaps open as I turn over to look clearly. There is no breeze out tonight. Then why is my hammock swinging? Furthermore, Barry is positioned to look out at the yard. I do it as partly an aesthetic thing, and symbolically, he's the guard of the house. So why is he looking at the camera? It unsettles me, even if he is just an inanimate object. I feel sympathy towards him as much as I do fear in this moment. This isn't special, of course. I pack bonded with my Roomba when I found out it gets scared during thunderstorms. But the point remains that Barry could not move himself. So who did? I close the app and take a moment to steady my nerves. I'd always been a nervous wreck at the best of times, and I didn't spend money on therapy to get past trauma for nothing. I grabbed my stuffed animal and rocked myself carefully until I could slow my breathing. There is a person at your front door. Fuck. No. No, 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 no. I ball my hands to fists and smack my temples an even number of times in frustration before I hold them down and, tears in my eyes, breathe once more. I remind myself I'm in control and take another tentative look at the app, feeling my skin crawl as it loads for an incessant amount of time, letting my mind wander once more. The camera looks out into my driveway and at the adjacent road. Directly opposite is the McPherson house, and to the right of them is a small clearing into the woods surrounding our suburb. It's vast and thick. God knows why anyone would go in there. You could get lost for days, possibly permanently if you're like me and have a minimal sense of direction. I've spent so many nights afraid I'd wake up in there one day and struggle to get home, succumbing to the elements or encountering something in there that saw me as an easy meal. So when the app loads and I see something in the clearing, a long neck extending from a short body and pulling its way towards me, I don't even need to register it to have a knee-jerk reaction of throwing my phone to the floor and clenching my teeth. <sighs> enough is enough. I'm just being irrational, stupid, overthinking it just like everyone told me before. There wouldn't have even been such a scene if I just... <sighs> no. No, I'm not doing this, I tell myself. Soft moonlight ebbing in from the bedroom window, situated on the opposite side of the condo. I'm not doing this. I look at the app, still open and stare hard at the shape on the screen, expecting a creature or a horrifying specter to appear. Nothing. The road is quiet and there's nothing in the clearing. But Barry is still staring at me, and it's unsettling me more than I care to admit. I don't like things out of their place or positioned wrong. It just sets my teeth on edge, and I feel like pulling every follicle of hair off my body when I can't alter it. It's fucking torture. I put on some clothes and saunter downstairs fiddling with the triple lock on my door and getting to the latch when I hear something that gives me pause. An ever so slight creak on the second step leading up to my condo. It's an older bit of wood that I intentionally left weaker. I'd love to say it was part of my master plan to catch a thief, but I just enjoyed the sound and, as I said, I hate moving set things. Now, however, that sound was sending a chill down my spine and a horrible thought crept into my head. What if they moved it intentionally? I stepped back and carefully slid the locks back into place, watching my movements as I found a safe place to sit down in my living room, hoping not to make a sound. I waited a good 15 minutes in absolute silence, ears trained to the outside before I felt safe to move upstairs, my mind thinking back to the incident that set all of this off. How, over a decade ago, someone started showing up in my workplace and telling me that I was the most special person they'd ever met, that I had such special genes, and they needed to know everything about me. 
They followed me incessantly wherever I went, knew all of my social media accounts, even the private ones, and made fresh alts the same hour I'd find to block the last ones, constantly spewing weird prophetic shit about how I'd be the most revered member of their club. I remember the night they broke into my parents' house, waking up to them standing over me in that weird fucking outfit, smile plastered over their wrinkled and hairy face. I remember wondering why they were smiling as they drew a serrated knife across my thigh and pulled the blood into a small vial before dashing for the door as they screamed the house down. The guy was a well-known nutjob from the homeless community who preached about some church of the dusk walker, that he knew the all-seeing prophet and the police had many run-ins with him, so they found him quick enough. He was sent to prison and that was the end of it, for him at least. It took years of therapy and a new job in an entirely new city to placate me. And even now I struggle. All the defenses in the world can't seem to stop someone when they're obsessed. Walking back up the stairs, punching the information in to call the authorities, my phone notifies me once more. There is a person at your front door. With shaking hands, I open the app and have to put my hand over my mouth to muffle the screams. It's him. He's older and malnourished, but it's absolutely him. Standing on the top of the stairs and leering at me, bent over a neck cocked to the side. But it's his neck. His neck, his fucking neck is too long. It's stretched out and there's veins all over it as it extends and pushes his head closer. Deadened eyes and a wide smile greet the camera as it gets closer. What do I do? What the fuck do I do? I run upstairs and pull the blankets over my head, phone still in hand, and shakily try to dial 911. But I have no idea what they'll even do if I tell them what I've seen. The phone rings out for what feels like forever when I hear a thumping sound against my window. The unfettered moonlight casting a shadow on my blankets that scars my mind and shocks me into silence. His head is smacking against the window pane, either in an attempt to get my attention or, more likely, to get inside. Hands pull at the hairs on my head and I dig my face into my knees, begging for it all to stop with every ounce of willpower I can muster. I rock there back and forth for an age, just repeating the same thing over and over, almost in tandem with his bumps. Stop it. Go away. You're not welcome. It takes some time, but the bumping inexplicably stops and I hear a snapping sound, followed by a low, desperate groan. I feel tears run down my face and blood from where I'd bitten my lip as I take in the intoxication of a silent night. There is a person at your front door. Fuck. This is designed to break me. Shaking hands open the app and for the first time, I can't contain my scream. It's an eye. A single, bloodied eye with full dilation jammed up against the camera. I could see something writhing in the darkness, twisting and dancing, beckoning to me even as I shriek so loud the lights begin to come out of the McPherson house. Something in the blackness is calling to me and a part of me wants to go to it. Every logical part of me feels unmitigated fear. My legs are shaking, my heart is pounding so fast that I feel dizzy as I stand and I can barely hear anything in my ears. Yet, I still walk to the door, to whatever is calling me. Eyes transfixed on the app as the strange shape beckons me. My hand slips off the first lock. The shape is no clearer, yet I feel a familiarity within it. The contours in the eye almost inviting. The second lock clicks and releases, and a rumble is audible in my ears. I feel comfort and warmth. I pull the chain on the latch and start to open the door to my calling as the Elder McPherson bellows at the top of his voice. Hey! Who the fuck are you? Get away from there! You got three seconds! And a shot rings out that snaps me into consciousness, hands still on the latch but pulling open the door as a blackened hand slips back through the gap, a horrific howling as it darts off of the tree line, more shots ringing out as I swing open the door, still on instinct. The second scream sounds familiar and a hot, acidic substance pours down my shirt as my eyes blur and I fall to the ground, Mr. McPherson's wife coming to my aid. It's mine. It's my scream. My vomit. What was left on the doorbell was an intact eye. Stalk and everything, pushed up against the camera with some tape. Black blood pooling on the ground, on the hammock, and on Barry. 
A note has been stamped next to it. Something that would force me to move once again and deny any strangeness that occurred that night. Maybe Sturgeon isn't the best town for me after all. I don't know what they see in me. But that question is more than enough to have me prepping to move once again. Do you see what I see? You see, this is why I practically live at the radio station, bedroom and all. Nobody to bother me on a lone radio tower. I got a trusty group of runners to protect me in the event of someone uninvited coming along. And a healthy stock of acidic products if they don't get the hint the first time. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly and we'd love to have you as part of the Dust Life family by subscribing, hitting the bell of alertness, it's just a normal bell but adding stuff like that is nice and leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. Dedication needs to be rewarded and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time we give thanks to Sean Scally, Colin Squire, Riley Ferranti, Dodgers82, Kaya Volk, Jason and Gamma are terrifying twosome at every premiere, and Ryan Kettles for giving us their valuable time. Want to get a shout out? Be sure to join our premieres or leave a comment below and I'll do my darndest to find the ones that stand out. Now I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the corners of YouTube, infecting the airwaves with our intoxicating presence. And when we hit 500, oh, we got something wonderful planned. And one last time, listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them, Dust God will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a nature documentary, eat some takeout, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow. Start and end each day with kindness in your heart. You matter, you are loved, and every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle dams. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, altruistic, truly magnificent Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us, Blackwells. We were synonymous with the first true tunnel system within Sturgeon. We helped flesh out the underground sewers and train lines as a result. Great Grandma Wilhelmina Callista Blackwell was truly a marvel when it came to design. She just needed to look once at the existing plans and know exactly where to dig. It was almost like instinct and at 125, that woman could still go. Of course, she had to make certain arrangements with the mud dwellers to ensure she didn't offend their ruler, Gregor the Mud Emperor. You see, there's an old British nursery rhyme known as Mud, Glorious Mud that alludes to hidden cities within the soft, meaty caverns underneath the earth. Some call it Sid Martin's Land, a place completely bathed in twilight. But regardless, it is home to a group of unusual individuals who slather themselves in mud armor, determined not to let anyone see what is underneath. Anyone, that is, who isn't Gregor the Ninth, the Mud Emperor. Gregor is what we call in Sturgeon a Dream King. He may look normal on the outside, but when you fall asleep, his alternate or uh, true form comes out. I've seen it uh, once. He stands on his hands, naked and letting his back bend as legs fall forward, gnashing teeth on the ends of them as his abdomen splits open, a dark chasm revealing itself. He will challenge you. He will hunt you, and it is your job to evade him and gain his favor, his respect. 
fail and, well, you don't want to fail. Through this intimidation, he became the Mud Emperor and thus had a deal to be made. New cabins would be constructed and the dreams of the destitute of Sturgeon would be fed to him. Grandma Wilhelmina was no fool. She knew this was not a good deal. So she shook hands with her left and called in Nell Lockwood and Buck Nasty McGraw, all then nightmare detectives, with her right. It was messy, but things were solved pretty darn quickly. And now we have tunnels and no nightmares. Huh. If you're just joining us, first of all, welcome and do not skip. I promise each of these are unique in their own way. We don't put subliminal messages for online bloggers to become bewitched by for nothing, you know. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some of them will make you cry, and some will provide you with the inescapable urge to go to your happy place. Now you remember your happy place, don't you, listener? I suppose it has been a while since you were last there. You lost the trail once you forgot the secret passphrase. The night shift manager wouldn't let you in, and, well, you made a bit of a scene the last time you failed. All people are born with a happy place, but so many lose their way. But not you, listener. You'd never truly lose your way. It was hidden from prying eyes and judgmental noses, their chests puffed out and clavicles twitching as they wondered how you could have such a grand, beauteous and charming happy place while theirs was so small, fragile and fleeting. They tried to take it away from you on the nights you were content, tried to burn it to the ground, infect it with hobgoblins or turn it into a hellscape. And instead, they decided to work you to the bone until you forgot about your happy place. You forgot the magenta sky, the oak trees that stretched into the heavens carrying strange, soft fruits, the way the pixies would look at you as you glided on by, and all of your imaginary friends housed in the parlor, eagerly waiting for your return. Well, worry not, listener, because the story has led you back there, back to your happy place. Just be wary you don't lose your way there again. Or, worse still, forget how to leave. Because all of us must know how to get out of our heads eventually, lest we attract unwanted attention. It's time to introduce our next story for this double feature. It comes to us once again from head custodian TJ Lee. And now TJ has sent me a message via Carrier Pigeon to remind you all that this is another entry about our wonderful town Sturgeon and the strange ongoings within it, both past and present. He encourages you all to check out the last Sin Eater story over on Rom Nexus channel, as she also covered tortoises and taros, which is an absolute treat. TJ isn't standing in the booth window this time. Maybe he's gone off to actually do his job for what... Oh. Oh my. Listeners... TJ has taped himself to the ceiling and is looking down on me. Smearing purple lipstick. No. No, that's not lipstick. That's crayon. Purple crayon over his lips and puckering them at me while using his sponge to wipe the dirt off the ceiling. He's mouthing something to me and reaching behind him to unstick something to the wall. Do you miss Lee from HR? What in the... Ah. I see. Well, TJ, I don't anymore. I'm just going to congratulate you on your hard work and forget you're up there at all. Ugh. If you like TJ's work here or elsewhere, be sure to show him some love over on Twitter at TJ Lee, his subreddit r slash TJ Lee, his podcast, The Writer's Mythos, where he looks into the untold tales of the world's most famous horror writers. He's very passionate about growing that one. And if you somehow have time, consider pre-ordering his first novella in the Chronicles of Sturgeon, The Last Sin Eater, releasing May 7th in Kindle and paperback on Amazon. He's eagerly hoping that since it's in the top 100 for a couple of categories ahead of release day, he can get it to number one by May 7th and slap best-selling writer next to head custodian on his resume. All linked below. A special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dustlight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dusklight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. 
Our cast today features our currently upside-down head custodian, T.J. Lee. All hail his genitorial wisdom. And, of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. I've been losing an average of 30 minutes of sleep every night for the past 10 days. Now I'm down to a paltry 4 hours and 30 minutes, my walls are beginning to shift and my vision is blurring. I have to focus. I need to focus. Someone out there has to know what happened. Does anyone know why the garbage collectors have switched to the night shift? Even asking it sends shivers down my spine. It's late and soon I will hear them turn up to collect. I can't sleep upstairs anymore. Not where they can see me. Now I sleep in the living room with my gun propped against my shoulder. The weight a stern reminder that I am present. I am awake. I am a threat to them. They won't try anything if I'm a threat to them, right? Fuck. I'm sorry. Let me explain. My name is Tyson. I'm a farmer with a thriving family, a loving wife, and two bright young boys. We live in a very remote area that requires a significant amount of divergence for basic services. I won't say where, and I won't risk my family or my business, especially knowing what kind of armchair detectives there are out there. I respect you all of what you do and fear you in equal measure. Though admittedly, I don't think you'd find a place like Sturgeon even if you tried. It's vast complex and not easy to traverse if you don't know the area. So I'd rather throw you a bone you can thoroughly chew on as opposed to delving into mine and my family's personal information. What I can tell you is this patch of land has been in my family for six generations. It was not acquired illegally, built on sacred land, and to the best of my knowledge, has never had a violent occurrence or bloodshed. We're just normal, hard-working folks who have always tried to do right which makes what's going on here all the more difficult to understand, to quantify and reason when the basic logic gives way. I hear you. You're undoubtedly scratching your heads and asking, why are the garbage collectors such an issue? And I don't blame you. But I'll get to that. Something shifted by the gates. No sound. Can't be the garbage men. You hear them a mile off. They're not subtle about making their presence known. The first night they turned up was so startling that I honest to God thought they were being robbed by the most unprofessional thieves this part of the world had ever birthed. Rambunctious, loud, and borderline jovial in their candor. It was always the same, each and every time. The sounds of the huge mechanical vehicle roaring as it drove up my dirt road, crushing twigs and kicking up dirt as it ground to a stop by the gate some fifty feet from my front door. Two thuds. Boots hitting the ground, stumbling over to the main gate where our trash was left for the garbage bin on a Tuesday. Usually a couple of surly men got out, grunted, and hauled ass out of the area as soon as possible. These two? Couldn't have been happier to be there from the sounds of things. Young men, the smiles almost visible in their tone. This the one, Bill? Looks ready to me. I reckon it is, Jeff. Let's get her done. A laugh, a high five, the sounds of something being dragged and thrown into the truck before they'd back out of the driveway and go off into the night. Unusual, right? My wife and kids certainly thought so, especially when the trash was still there the next morning. Maybe there were some kids pulling a prank, my wife would remark, taking a sip from her coffee and glancing nervously out the window. I think she was saying it more for our boys to benefit than my own. I nodded and ushered them away from the windows and told them to go play. But the next night, it happened again. No specific time so much as that dead of night period between 1 in the morning and 3 in the morning when the world falls totally silent around you. 
None of our animals made a peep during that time frame, nor did we dare to. Because when we heard them roll up again, we were paralyzed with fear. It took a few minutes to realize it, but when I looked to my wife and she returned my fearful glance with a wide-eyed stare and a nod, we scooped up the boys and huddled into our bed. The exact same sounds, the exact same timed footsteps, the exact same conversation. We heard them drag something wet into the truck before leaving after maybe 15 minutes. My younger boy Jace was always anxious, and hearing this uncanny valley shit at his age sent him into a panic attack. We spent the remaining time soothing him while my older son Travis took to peering through the window behind me. Our pig pen that lay some 40 feet to the right of the house had the door ripped off the hinges and a blood trail leading from the entrance all the way to the farm gates where the garbage men had been. When we mustered up the courage to inspect further, the pigs were silent, unmoving and staring at the long dirt road that led away from the home. The tall trees that littered our farm looming overhead as if to silence them from telling what they'd seen. We tried calling the city council to complain, but they were as perplexed as we were. Said trash pickup day was still Tuesday, and that since it was only Saturday, we weren't due. They advised we file a complaint, but the police were trespassers, but that yielded absolutely nothing. And in the meantime, things escalated. Night 3 brought us the same routine, same sounds. Even after we'd taken to putting a lock on the pig pen, they still took one, this time making sure to leave a small pile of viscera behind. Perhaps as a warning. We elected to putting the animals in the barn and deadbolting it, hoping the pranksters would get the message and perhaps get bored. I'd ordered a CCTV camera but with my location being so out of the way, it was going to take time to arrive and I wasn't about to stand in my window with a camera pointed out at some weirdos. We... We didn't consider the consequences of this defiance. It was night five. The boys were sleeping in our room and like clockwork, they showed up and pulled me from the little sleep I was getting, my wife soon after. Silently, goosebumps raised on our skin and a chill in our bones. We strained our ears against the open window, hoping to hear the frustration and subsequent decision to leave. The routine continued until Jeff spoke to Bill. The moment they opened their mouths, I knew something was horribly, horribly wrong. This the one, Bill? Looks locked to me. I reckon it is, Jeff. Let's pay him a visit. They rattled our front doorknob and politely knocked at the door. Five rhythmic knocks. Five seconds of silence. Five more aggressive knocks. I bolted downstairs and grabbed my rifle, keeping the lights off but my aim focused on him. Adrenaline pushing fear aside, if only to defend my family. I don't know who the fuck you are, but you've been coming onto my property unannounced and I ain't standing for it no more. I pulled back on the bolt and the sound filled the room. You got three seconds to turn on your heel or I'm firing. My eyes adjusted to the front door and in the darkness, two shapes stood behind my door, shrouded in the shadow of night. They were tall, thin legs and bizarre movements like, like they were swaying in place. Those three seconds felt like a fucking eternity. One! The shadow to the front leaned forward, trying to press its face against the glass. Something was wrong. Two! It moved away and tapped the letterbox, testing if it opened up. When it did, it held it open and spoke as the second shadow stepped closer. Three never came. Instead, I backed away out of terror and barricaded our room, unable to speak. It repeated my last words back at me. Exact same pitch, exact same tone, but something was off about it. Like hearing your own voice played back through old speakers, you sense an eeriness to it. As I'd instinctively taken steps back, however, the other one spoke. This was the first time either had said anything that didn't either repeat. And I swear to God, it makes my heart pound in my throat just typing it. We have come to collect. Come outside. My legs carried my body before I could register what was going on. Rushing to the bedroom and locking it, I pulled my family in close and held my head down to theirs, desperate to block out whatever ungodly sounds erupted from our front door. 
It took half an hour before they gave up, assumed their usual routine and left, the sound of the tires speeding off of the road bringing some degree of relief. Until the following morning when our nearest neighbors, the Gundersons, reported a break into their farm some five miles up the road. The perpetrators had smashed through the gate, entered the barn, and done such violent acts to their cattle that of the ten that had been attacked and mutilated, only two had survived and were immediately put out of their misery by the patriarch, Ted. You been having the problems with those sons of bitches too, Ty? He bellowed down the phone once I began retelling our sleepless events. Shit, you sound like hell and probably look worse than the cows at this point. I ain't having it. You got a young family to support, and when they hurt one of us, they hurt all of us. Tonight, we put an end to it, you hear? I nodded, agreeing to stake out our property that night and do whatever needed to be done. Hands still shaking, I grabbed a stiff drink from the cabinet. Never been much of a drinker. Most of this was my dad's for the tougher times. But if the times weren't tough now, I don't know when the fuck they would be. Ted rolls up around 11 p.m. Wife and kids are asleep and we shoot the shit in the living room for a while, mainly discussing how the harvest has gone and what we could do to protect our livelihoods in this day and age. The conversation petered off as they often do when a night draws on, but it was as we fell silent that the realization swept over us. We were going to confront these people tonight. I gripped my gun a little tighter and Ted gave me an assuring nod, peeking out the window for any signs of the garbage man. Son of the... My farm! He bellowed, springing to his feet and bursting out the door before I could get a word in edgeways. He was halfway down the road before I could ask him what the fuck he was doing. He turned, his eyes wild with fear and rage, pointing a shaking finger to the small shape that was his house far across the hill. It was on fire. Large pillars of smoke billowing forth as the fire danced in the light, illuminating the surrounding fields. I can't sit here while my farm, my livelihood burns away, Ty. If those bastards are behind this, well, you can bet your ass they won't last the night when I'm through with them. I'll teach them a fucking lesson about the value of things. The things people throw away. With that, he turned on his heel and ran to his truck, speeding off before anything more could be said. This would be the only night the garbage bin don't pass a visit. I get a bit of extra sleep, but my wife doesn't. She just stares out the window at the Gunderson farm in the distance and shakes her head. She knows how there will be no help on the horizon. She knows how close we are to that fate. And seeing that scares me to death. The eighth night. They arrive with no vehicle sounds. The grand build up to the crescendo of their routine. They whistle softly as if calling an animal patient in their call as they scrape something around in the dirt. I'm crippled by fear and cannot dream facing them. I look around in the dark and see Lucy is still asleep. Travis is snoring in the corner, but... But Jace... My boy, he's wide awake and transfixed. And staring at the window overlooking our driveway, reaching out to open it. I leap out of bed and just about tackle him away. The shock of waking up to such a violent affair sending him into a panic attack as the entire family snaps awake in a frenzy, shouting over one another as he cries uncontrollably. This has got to stop, Tyson. We can't do this anymore. We can't live like this. My wife was right. Lucy was exhausted, her eyes barely open and her teeth chattering. In the moment of silence between us, the whistling started again, almost mocking it in its tone if it weren't for the sinister giggling behind it. Shut up! Shut up! Shut the fuck up and leave us alone! She screamed, walking towards that same window. It took everything I had to hold her back and she fell to pieces in my arms. The entire family crippled by nerves and a lack of sleep. It was only when the one voice cut the air that the final night's events were set in motion. The things people throw away. Oh, fuck. Ted. One look into my wife's eyes and I knew what she was thinking. There was no stopping her. She darted around, packing the kids' clothes and any essentials she could find, ignoring the whistling outside and instructing our boys to focus on getting whatever they needed. She turned to me. You do what you need to do. I don't care if the nearest town is a three-hour drive or I undergo the seven-hour drive to my mom's. I will not stay another night in this fucking house. Not until they're gone. She was almost delirious. 
fueled by fear and anger as she darted around like a hurricane, turning over the tables to get what she needed as if prepping for a weather event. Within a half hour she'd been rushing around, the noises had faded and the outside, once again, fell silent. I couldn't leave the house. It had been in our family's lineage for generations. We'd been born here, lived here, and died here no matter what. As the head of the family, it was my job to stay here and protect it. Even if I couldn't protect those that I loved the most under its roof. She waited another hour before getting in the car and leaving, kissing me with all the passion she'd had when we first met. I told Jace that he had to be strong, and that he'd one day conquer his fears because I believed in him. I told Travis that as the eldest, he needed to protect them like his life depended on it. Then, just like that, I waved them goodbye and promised I'd join them at their mother-in-law's when this was over. Now all that was left was to sharpen my resolve and find out what this was. I took the chance to try and get some sleep during the day, but no matter how hard I tried, it wouldn't come to me. So liquid courage it was. One way or another, this was going to end. Night 9. The penultimate night. Not a sound. I mean that in the most literal sense. The wind didn't move. The trees didn't speak. Not a single blade of grass danced and no dirt was kicked up. Everything was silent. So silent. My own thoughts were amplified in this void of sound. Every inane thought of what could happen flitted through my mind and forced me to double-check every fucking window and door. Triple-check the locks, ensure no oversight was left. Couldn't let them get an opportunity, even if it's just me. I know they're watching even now. If I didn't know any better, I'd have said a shadow move just behind the porch window. I can't be sure. Not without checking. I think they were biding their time, keeping me on edge and making sure that I knew they could step in whenever they wanted and do as they pleased. But I kept my nerve. I resisted the urge to bolt to the truck. I've got my whiskey, and I've got my gun. I'll see this through, even if it kills me. Night 10. <laughs> now we're all caught up. I checked on the animals this morning. What was left was a pile of bones, flesh, and waste. They'd been taken the night before, and I don't know how I didn't hear during the silence. There was but one horse's body left. Teeth marks riddled the torso, and the legs had been torn off. Our crops had grown fetid, decayed, and worn. Nothing in our farm would yield a goddamn thing anymore. <laughs> my livelihood was decimated in front of my eyes. Gone. It's late now. I'm sat in my armchair with the rifle loaded and ready. My hands are shaking and my knee won't stop bouncing. I feel the dread start in my gut and worm its way through my chest before lodging in my throat and forcing every breath to be a labor of pain. They came early tonight. Truck roaring and routine sounds in full swing. Only, there weren't two sets of thuds this time. There were six. We walked up to the porch, a shadow covering every facet of the window and door panes, not a speck of light coming through. The voices don't change their pattern. <laughs> they never do. This the one, Bill? Looks ready to me. They pound their fists against the window, a dull moan emanating from the background, pained, muffled, and growing in strength. I reckon it is, Jeff. Let's get her done. Nails dragged down the glass, a horrific groaning accompanying the repeated intonations of their godforsaken phrases. The things people throw away. Ah, oh, Ted. Poor Ted. Smashing his head against the wall, repeating it with every sick swing. It was only when I heard the fourth voice that I finally looked out the window. Perhaps on instinct. Not until they're gone. My Lucy. <laughs> My sweet Lucy calling to me. I can't begin to tell you what I saw when I pulled back the curtains for just a split second. But every forbidden aspect of it is burned into my brain, and it will not leave me even as I shut my eyes in the surrounding course of madness. My kids. My fucking... 
fucking kids are now saying they've come to collect. That I must come outside. That whistle has come back and it's... Oh, it's almost soothing. I can't bear to do this on my own. I can't live with that image in my fucking skull anymore. I miss my wife. I miss my kids. I miss sleeping soundly at night. What if... What if it's them out there? What if they're really just wanting me to get help and my own sick mind has put me in such a state that I'm here? Asking you all for help on something that is, at its core, just truly simple. I'm gonna put the laptop down and open the door. I have to know. I have to. Why did the garbage bin start coming in the dead of night? Does anyone know? Why do I feel like this story is allegorical for something? Maybe some other kind of, uh, cleaning service provided by an entity that is clearly something more sinister than it appears on the surface? Hmm. Maybe looking up will provide the answer. Don't you think, listeners? Why do the garbage men come at night? We don't have garbage men here at Dusklight. No, we simply feed our garbage to the gaping maw in our basement. It doesn't seem to mind what we throw into it. Food, plastics, relics, creatures, hopes and dreams, emotional baggages, regrets, or unwanted things. It takes it all with glee, and occasionally it spits out something of value. Last time I threw in an unwanted thing, it gave me a shiny new collar, a glass eye that swiveled to follow me wherever I went, and a bottle of Mama Killer's Pulse Thumper 30th Anniversary Edition. Looks like crystallized seawater. Mm, it tastes is just as bad. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly, and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of corruption, it's just a normal bell, but adding stuff like that is nice, and leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. Dedication needs to be rewarded, and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time we give thanks to Soul Pillow, Laren Listens, Isaac Peace, Jason and Gamma, our terrifying twosome at every premiere, and the character known as Just Making It Work for giving us their valuable time. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of YouTube, infecting the airwaves with our intoxicating presence. And when we hit 500, we got something wonderful planned. And one last time, listeners. Close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them, Dusklight will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a nature documentary, eat some takeout, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow. You matter, you are loved, and every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle dams. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, altruistic, stupendously fabulous Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us Blackwells. We tend to be involved in many an unusual oddity in Sturgeon, a dash of calamity here, and a heavy helping of depravity there. Nobody ever said we were a boring bunch, that's for sure. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. 
My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some, well, some of you decided to seek out a bar in between spaces. See, in Sturgeon, there's a bustling entertainment district that houses a vice for almost every occasion. Drugs beyond your wildest dreams, parlors catering to all manner of enjoyments, the eponymous hotel inertia that houses entire realities on every floor, the underground nightmare fighting pit, and a bar that shows up to the lost, destitute and broken when they are in need or about to make a key choice. A friendly barman will greet you, offer you a strange concoction in exchange for your story. He'll tell you what you need and, on his recommendation, your path may change. Listeners, we are about to visit that bar and understand one of Sturgeon's great adventures as told by T.J. Lee, who feverishly recorded this with a slew of cast members while he was consuming liquefied purple crayons. These will be released episodically with a full-length version coming at the end of it for all of you binge-happy listeners who need our airwaves to attain that higher level of awareness and to keep the bug people off your frequency. We do understand. It's time for our next story of this evening. This tale, A Dark Cloud Followed Me Home, is another recollection of Sturgeon's current events by constant chronicler of the chaotic concealed T.J. Lee. T.J. wants you to do two things, listener. He wants you to follow him on Twitter at TJ Lee to help feed his fragile ego, and he wants you to pre-order his second novella, The Spaces in Between, out September 30th, because he says his purple crown wife will not last a winter without, uh, sustenance. I tried asking him what that was, but he just drew all over my face and said, Not for you to know, green crayon infidel. Hmm. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Moe for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dusklight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dusklight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. And we must thank the amazing Romnex for really making our thumbnails sn- Prince of Perpetual Pestilence, T.J. Lee, all hail his genitorial wisdom. And of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. I'm Professional Cloud Watcher. Only one left that I know of, in fact. I'm sure there are others, watching their own skies for information and signs, but at least for my little corner of the earth, it's just me. Old Sam the Cloud Watcher, as they call me. Or just the odd ball staring up, mouth agape at the sky. That too. But I'm coming here in the hopes that someone else can shed some light on recent occurrences. Perhaps some other cloud watching enthusiast or licensed professional. As the title suggests, one of them has followed me home and I'm unsure as to how to get rid of it. I realise how strange that sounds, to be a professional cloud watcher. After all, isn't it just staring up at the sky? How hard can that be? Sounds relaxing, actually. Well, there's a bit more to it, and it boils down to the same thing any profession requires. Aptitude. While almost everyone loves watching clouds, very few actually see what the clouds mean what they are concealing, and what that spells for the future of the area those particular clouds are formed over. It's not something you learn. Not at first, anyway. You have to see the patterns naturally before it can be cultivated. You see it all the time in films. A couple or some friends are laying down cloud watching. They see shapes in the clouds like food, animals, or sometimes what they want to see. 
It's the latter that shows something special. I was always fascinated by the clouds. My father would scold me for constantly daydreaming and losing myself in the skies and subsequently failing my tests at school. But one day, I pointed something out to him in the sky, looming behind a particularly large, bright cloud obscuring the sun. That one there. There's a catcher behind it. You can see its hands peering out from the corner. I think we're going to get a storm soon. My dad looked at me, bewildered, and told me there was no such thing inside the clouds, that he could only see the usual bland shapes and designs. He sent me to bed without dinner, even as I protested that we had to take shelter, shouting to the rest of our family and neighbours until he placated me with promises of a father-son trip if I stopped this cloud nonsense. I awoke that night to the sounds of billowing winds uprooting trees, thunderclaps that burst the eardrums and bursts of horrific ball lightning ripping through the streets below. By the time my family realised what was going on, it was too late. Within 17 minutes, my little town, formerly known as Great Salmon, had been decimated. It was found in my bed, amid a ton of wreckage, bruised but alive and repeating, cloud catcher, over and over. I was taken in, educated, and my gift for cloud watching grew. I was sought out by other small towns for predicting the weather, helping to prepare for threats and what unusual clouds would entail. It's been a good way to live for some time. I get to help others and I get to relax, watching the clouds in the process. The problem is, the latest town I'm helping to cloud watch for has a far more unique weather situation. Most of you will have seen more manner of cloud formations without really considering it for more than a few seconds. Heavy dark clouds rolling in as the storm approaches, a blanket of grey and white obscuring the sun for a chilly day. Speedy white battalions giving way to small slithers of radiant blue on a summer's afternoon, and so forth. But what do you do when the clouds you watch don't conform to any of that? What do you do when the clouds bring with them a life of their own? The mayor of this town reached out and implored me to come and visit, said that once every summer solstice they were besotted by an unknown weather calamity that came in three stages over three weeks ending with untold destruction and death to the town. They could never see anything more than just the clouds, but they knew something was lurking up there. They said if I could find out what it was before the final stage, it could save a lot of lives. I could save a lot of lives. How could I refuse to help? And I won't lie, the prospect of something new lurking in the clouds was most certainly enticing. My first day on the job here involved my usual ritual. Park up on the highest hill overlooking the town with an opportune vantage point. Drink some Fiji water and play some Vaporwave while I sat in the hood of my car and took notes. To help put into context what I saw and why I've come for you all today, here's some of the more relevant logs. For the sake of time, I'll only share a handful. Day 1. Blue sky. White clouds. One hour. Their density is thick. They march in a structured formation to the west. Their generals up front with tendril-like white edges to their almost marshmallow base. They rush past me, but carry no breeze. Small patches of the sun's light eke out from between the bars the clouds keep it behind, permitting next to no contact with the outside world. If I didn't know any better, I'd say the clouds were patrolling the skies, keeping something at bay. Three hours. There's a single conglomerate of blackened clouds rolling in. A gang from another turf, perhaps. They take no prisoners as they bullhorn their way through the nearby docks and capsize a couple of fishing boats in the process, staining the ground with a black, viscous tar. I hear a car nearby swerve and crash. Oh, I hope they're okay. I see the thin gap of blue sky rapidly being dispersed, the white clouds converging around it as if to defend it. Something in the general clouds begins to stir, and I sense a bitter wind on the horizon. Four hours. It is almost sunset, but there is no lavender sky or palette of beautiful colours to marvel at. Instead, I watch the black clouds push in until they are nearly overhead, their anger felt by every citizen in the town below. So many are covered in the black tar that brought me here, though I didn't believe it when they told me. It cakes the great spires and oozes through the windows. The people here call it the slow rot and won't tell me what it does to anyone who comes into physical contact with it. 
There's a clear line between the bright and grey clouds and that of the dark ones. Something in the lead black cloud moves and a brilliant spark of red ripples through its body, sparking all the way down the ranks before depositing its contents. A sea of red descends on the town and mixes with the black tar, causing it to bubble and fizz like acid. When it's finished, the clouds depart as quick as they came. I can still hear people screaming as I drive back to my lodge. Day 5. Yellow sky. Yellow clouds. One hour. I got here at sunrise, the last few days bringing with them a strange set of stairs that start by the steps of the hill and ascend far beyond the perceivable clouds. There's a smell of barbecues and freshly cut grass in the wind. An attempt at bringing you forth nostalgia from within me, perhaps? Who could say? But the sky has concerned me for some time. Why is it yellow? I don't mean it's simply a sunny day, I mean the blue hue that was here from the first day has long since been erased, and in it sits an almost artificial yellow. I can no longer tell where the sunlight is coming from, and something in that realisation is most unsettling. It feels like I've been to an exhibit housing a dangerous creature, and now the cage is either empty or covered with a cloth, and I'm assured it's still there, even when I don't hear anything. I won't lie. I do wish to go up those stairs, but I am not willing to just yet. I must understand what all this means first. Three hours. I must have looked away for no more than 15 minutes in order to check my logs and any info on strange anomalies in the sky, but when I looked back, the stairs had vanished, and the clouds had completely restructured. Great mountainous pillars littered the sky and continued for untold distances in either direction. As my eyes followed to the center, my jaw dropped and my skin grew taut, bumps forming and every hair standing on end. A small set of buildings and strange structures comprised of a denser, more malleable cloud material hung in the sky overhead, both feeling as if I could reach out and touch it, but also impossibly far above me. I followed from the entrance archway up to a longhouse, the door slowly opening and releasing the light that was missing from the skies. Within, I caught a glimpse of something. I can't be sure what it was, but I know that in the few seconds I locked eyes with it, the colour drained from the clouds, and a chill ran through me that was so biting I had to look away and grab a sweater to cover up. When I looked back, the clouds had become a pallid grey and covered the sky completely. Seven hours, I slept up here. During my dream, I'd floated up to the clouds and stood on the grand archway. The colours were a rich purple and lavender. I felt at ease, communicating with some entities that were neither here nor there. Dream logic, I suppose. They told me they appreciated my willingness to understand them, to study them and help those down below, but that the solstice brings with it a new beginning that cannot be stopped. Still, they said, I must speak with them and see for myself. I was led into the longhouse. It was far bigger in person, fit to hold something several hundred times my own size. The beings didn't venture too close to its interior, seemingly intimidated. As I walked its great halls, obelisks of clouds and shapes of creatures I'd never seen, I found myself at the foot of a throne made from ash and fog, the seat a constant churning thunder. I could not tell you if something was said upon it. My mind has elected to redact that information but I do recall what it said to me in a deep, commanding voice that resonated within my bones. Cloud Catcher Cometh. I went home that night, and I kept my curtains closed. Day 11. Tall clouds. Green sky. I awoke with a start, the sound of cicadas shrieking in a fish and alarm clock here. It took me a few seconds to realise that something else was shrieking along with them. As I ventured out to my balcony, I saw the town bathed in a dark hue of green, angelic horns blasting from the depths of the clouds above as a warning siren, but nobody was heeding it below. To my horror, the black clouds had come in from the east. Thick plumes descended from their ranks and congregated in the streets, 
amalgamated shapes of humanoid creatures clad in storm cloaks and bearing lightning bolts for teeth screeched as they latched themselves to fleeing citizens, devouring them or enshrouding them in their fog. I could do nothing as the black clouds above smashed against the defiant greys and whites, great thunderclaps echoing around us. The grey clouds had formed huge structures with which to create a fortress around the green patch of sky. They refused to let anything near it. The moment of truth came as the largest pillar in the grey sky arched back and swung itself over the ranks of the others, colliding with the black cloud with such force that it split the sky in two, the green sky exposed and eradicating the beasts below. In the spire off to the distance, a woman clad in black had her arms held out wide and her head tilted back, reveling in the green glow. I felt dizzy staring out at the green sky for too long and took myself back to bed, the soft crying of the townsfolk weighing heavily on my conscience. I didn't have the heart to tell them what I'd seen. Not yet. Before I share with you this last log, I feel it is important to explain what I believe is being concealed in the skies and who or what is coming after it. It's been a long-standing belief that there are things that lurk within the deep sky. The first humans who crawled out of the caves believed the sun itself was a god, to be revered and feared in equal measure as it brought them sunlight and safety each day before the darkness came and brought instead a slew of predators that craved human flesh. So it's no small leap of faith to assume what is being kept in the sky above this town. A sleeping, ancient god. I don't mean a god in the sense of what traditional beliefs hold. I don't believe this is something omniscient or omnipresent. But it is powerful. And it knows that people covet its power. Which leads me on to the black clouds. To the cloud catcher I mentioned before. There have always been people who crave power and will get it by any means necessary. Those who have not the means themselves will frequently utilize methods of force to grab it, using any tools they see as proficient. <laughs> tools like me. Day 18, Crimson Sky, Obsidian Clouds. It is dark when I ascend to the top of the hill, but it is only 10.45 in the morning here. The townsfolk have taken shelter underground or in the churches. I was able to relate to the mayor what the danger was and, in turn, receive their gratitude. I did not guarantee them I could fix the issue, but they seem satisfied to know what is lurking in their skies and what is coming to try and take it. Old towns have old traditions, that much is certain. It is not my place to question them or judge them, especially when I have seen the strangeness for myself. While it can be chalked up to strange chemicals in the air, unusual weather patterns or collective hysteria, my job is to interpret and extrapolate. And that's what I'll do. I'd be lying if I said I knew what the cloud catcher was. But it has been known to me for some time, just as the clouds I'm familiar with have been. I stood atop that hill, vulnerable to the elements and the burning sensation of the crimson sky. No white or grey clouds to remain to shield me. The once dark clouds had now adopted an obsidian hue, solid in their structure and single-minded in their resolve to take what they wanted. This time, I did not relent as I watched them, waiting for the large cloud to pass over me. It undulated and split apart, ugly hands and furtive eyes peering over its edges. I don't dare speak of what it looked like further. Giving it further power is not wise, but it saw me, and it remembered me and I made a deal with it. If it followed me away from this town, from its people who had seen untold ruin and slaughter every summer solstice for centuries, I would give it new places to feed and thrive with its kin. It agreed, and the remainder dispersed, the singular black cloud following me wherever I travel. Now, I bid my farewells to the town and travel to my next job, a small town not far from this one. Sturgeon. And so it brings me to the present, to sitting in my car on a silent, singular road cleared by thick trees and a blotted out sun that my cloud-catching companion has assured will never shine on me again. My dreams are now fraught with this creature peering over the skies in my sleeping realm, determined that it will one day bring me into the clouds and harness my skills for itself. It is always hungry, and I cannot feed it forever. 
If any of you out there are seasoned cloud watchers or readers of the heavens above, I beg you to offer me your advice before I reach my next destination. Before I reach this humble little town of oddities known as Sturgeon. Please, how do I stop this black cloud from consuming me? The Dark Cloud is many things to many people, listeners. Some see it as a metaphor for the mental anguish we all suffer through from time to time. Others look at it as an allegory for misery and grief. But in Sturgeon, it is a signifier of things to come. Dangerous things. Only time will tell how bad it may be. But I will tell you this much, dear listener. I am afraid. For the first time in a long time, I am afraid. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions, including the Sturgeon playlist. We're adding them regularly, and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of foreboding. It's just a normal bell, but adding stuff like that is nice. And leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. Dedication needs to be rewarded, and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time we give thanks to Wet, Viola Pro, Lady Nevermore, Ryan Kettles, Baron Von Pasta, Amy S., Tyler Olson, Blue Sharpie, Other Unit, New Audio of Alexandria, Rain Lord, Steven Stevens, Jason and Gamma, our terrifying twosome at every premiere, and Penny Tails Up for giving us their valuable time. Want to get a shout out? Be sure to join our premieres or leave a comment below and I'll do my darndest to find the ones that stand out. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of YouTube, infecting the airwaves with our intoxicating presence. 500 is done. How long to 1000? And, one last time listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them. Dusklide will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a video about emperor penguins, eat something spicy, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow with the window open and the stars twinkling down on you. Start and end each day with kindness in your heart, a reminder to be better today than you were yesterday. You matter. You are loved. And every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets. And dusk enters the station. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, they deez and gentle thems. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio. Hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, iridescent, irresponsible Everett J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us, Blackwells. Are we offered the first visual aid clinic for those going through bad trips when on strong drugs? A way to find and eliminate the more undesirable parts of tripping balls. It was called Blackwell's Bad Trip Bohemian Haberdashery. And Cousin Fulton wasn't the best at names, but people liked the word haberdashery, and it stuck. Folks would come in or be shepherded in by one of death's emissaries that keeps an eye on those who may find themselves in an unfortunate end while supremely high. Their job is 24-7. Maybe wandering into the forest of the Leshy and thinking that climbing frames could have them meet an unfortunate end, or going into Sturgeon's sewer system to pretend they're a ninja turtle, only to be eaten ass first by the Kappa. That sort of thing. It's a thankless job being an emissary of death. We'd hook up wires to the brain and a small clip onto the earlobe that honed into their brain frequencies. Then, an image would generate on the screen, and one of our family or a trained voodoo practitioner would be handed a Super Nintendo controller to eliminate the problem. Trained professionals only, folks. Now, 
I know what you're thinking. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, select, start to win, right? Or better yet, cheat and hack the trip. But we tried that. It summoned an entity known as Noldus, who wore a thick cloak made of collapsed stars and the broken dreams of a million artists. He stood in front of the screen and began lifting his veil, showing us the face of a man who controls the dreamscape, a place uh, we tried to interfere with. Cousin Fulton was the one playtesting that day, and, uh, well, he's been in servitude ever since. We don't see much of him anymore. Not in the waking world, at least. Probably for the best. Yelp reviewers did us in the end, though. Too many people saying their trips got too mundane. Too samey. Not realizing that the spirit animal they were talking to wasn't any such thing, but actually a parasite sending them to their untimely death. There's only so many zero stars you can take before you close up shop, folks. But we still have the equipment in storage. You know, desperate times and all that. Kinda relevant for the story in hand, I suppose. If you're just joining us, first of all, welcome and do not skip. I promise each of these are unique in their own way. We don't borrow astral projections of the world's most creative and broken artists to throw shackles on them for nothing, you know. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some will encourage you to diet. Now, you don't need me to tell you how to live your life, but you didn't need to go on a diet. At least not this one. The story led you to this diet, however. It's complex, the numbers are a confusing jumble to anyone who tries to follow it, and nobody ever sees you eat. But you do eat. Just things that you prefer to hide from them. Only you understand what this diet is, as guided by the story instructed by the story. One day you look in the mirror and admire your more slim physique, toned muscles, and you smile at yourself in admiration of the work you did. But your reflection doesn't smile back. It grimaces and holds the diet plan up to the mirror, scrawled in blood and a viscous substance like molasses, your original form coming back into focus as it asks with pained eyes, why? You did not need to diet. You are always so beautiful. You are so beautiful. You just needed to listen to your reflection and not the story. But now the reflection has gotten loose. It is hurting and it is coming for you. Let us hope the story offers you another plan. It's time to introduce our next story for this double feature. It comes to us, once again, from head custodian T.J. Lee. Now, T.J. has sent me a polite telegram to remind you all that this is another entry about our wonderful town Sturgeon and the strange ongoings within it, both past and present. He encourages you to check out the last Sin Eater story over on Rom Nexus channel after this one, and that a familiar name may be popping up for eagle eared fans. He wrote this in crayon. Purple crayon. I can tell because when he smiles at me with that childlike glee from the window, it's staining his teeth. I told HR about this behavior before. I thought they'd have talked to him by now. He's got something in his hands and it's just out of my view from the booth, but he keeps patting it gently when I'm not looking and hiding it behind his back. If I just crane my neck to... He's put a stern note up on the window and is staring at me with contempt. It says, Lee from HR has gone on a sabbatical. Ah, uh, I don't. TJ's shaking his head and looking down at the shape. He's talking to it. He, he nods and makes that gesture where he puts his fingers to his eyes and then to mine before sauntering off. Mop bucket in hand and a half-eaten purple crane on his front pocket. I, uh, I think I'm going to be a little nicer to him from now on. Until we get a new HR person in. If you do like TJ's work here or elsewhere, be sure to show him some love over on Twitter at TJ Lee, his subreddit r slash TJ Lee, his podcast, The Writer's Mythos, where he looks into the untold tales of the world's most famous horror writers. We're trying to grow it, folks. And if you somehow have time left over, 
Maybe you should consider pre-ordering his first novella in the Chronicles of Sturgeon, The Last Sin Eater, as adapted by the amazing Romnex, releasing May 7th in Kindle and paperback. He's eagerly hoping that since it's in the top 100 for a couple of categories ahead of release day, he can get it to number one by May 7th and slap best-selling writer next to head custodian on his resume. All of these a link below. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dustlight bows at the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head for allowing Dustlight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. Our cast today features our janitor and narrator TJ Lee. And of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. And we appreciate you joining us on our premiere. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. I should preface this by stating that I'm... Not much of a smoker. Wow. Amazing tone to set on a 420 experience, right? I just don't want to lie to you. Not when discussing the shit that went down. I finally focused enough to talk. Uh, I know some of the specialists here are keen to talk to me some more. But for now, I've ignored them and decided to focus on getting this out there. This needs to be explained. And I am... I am desperate to get this out of my system. Literally and figuratively. I never want to experience this high again. The Eldritch Bud came up in conversation last 420 with my best friends Kai and perennial stoner Kenny. It was right as COVID was spreading across the world and stopping any of us from seeing one another for a traditional wake and bake. Kai would eat the brownies and binge Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'd take advantage of the abundance of snacks while politely declining the dank kush. And Kenny would show off a new strain he'd bought from the marijuana store in town. Bro, the Eldritch Bud is like, man, it's like the dark holy grail of the weed mythos. It's like, it's like the Darth Vader of the weed universe, or the grizzly bear of the weed kingdom. <laughs> his eyes glazed over and taking a drag from his blunt, the smoke-filled video screen added to the atmosphere. Strongest shit in sturgeon, my guy. It's a strong strain, I get it. Can we eat it too, or... Kai asked, shoveling ramen into his mouth at lightning speed while screaming expletives at a league game in the background. Our Discord server was rarely ever free of some kind of shit talking, so it was easy to block out. Nah, I mean, yeah, I guess you can eat it, but... It's not just strong, bruh. It's like, it's like dark, dark. Shit makes you see things, go to a special place. They say it helps you, like, ascend and that it can either be the best or worst experience, depending on if you're ready. Kenny looked intense, but excited, as if he were talking about a mythical creature. It changes you inside and out, man. You go in one guy, come out another. Special different oh no man isn't that the kind of shit mushrooms and psychedelics do i'm not an expert or anything i trailed off kai swallowed a mouthful of noodles before making a mock ringing noise ring 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 oh shit paging dr tyson mcgraw drug md he puffed up his chest and pretended to be a busty woman, adding a breathy voice in for good measure. McGraw, senpai, you need to just tell us if this is a different strain, bro. Ooh, ooh. Laughter rang out through the call and I felt embarrassed. But I knew enough about weed to know that it could do some weird things. But not the type that Kenny was describing. Still, when the laughter died down, he was steadfast in his resolve. I swear, guys, I'm gonna grab some for when we can hang safely next time. 
I know a guy. He said it wasn't the right time, but that he'd hit me up when he'd got more, and even gave me a discount, man. And this time, he points to the camera. At me. You're trying some, Ty. I know you've been curious. What better place to try than with your friends? I want to see if you see what I see, bro. He was right. I had expressed interest, but I'd never worked up the courage. The guys would never pressure me, but I did feel I was missing out on trying at least the once. When he said, friends, <laughs> I could still recall Kai's dumb, cheesy grin, still pretending to be a nurse and get a rise out of me. That image will never leave my mind with all the things that succeeded it. I agreed, and the conversation was forgotten in a sea of lengthy discord calls over the summer and winter of 2020. Memes, failed online relationships, and video game tournaments dominated the conversations. But, as things began to shift, and we all found ourselves free and safely able to hang out, Kenny messaged the server on the 19th with just three words in all caps. I. Got. It. He attached a photo of himself smiling ear to ear with a large bag of black and green material. It looked almost thorny and thick in texture, but his excitement was infectious. I couldn't help but share in his enthusiasm when I replied, We'll be there. Snacks and all. We rolled up in the late afternoon as the sun began to set. Kai holding an assortment of potato chips, sodas, and ready for what I anticipated would be, at most, a very mellow experience with some mild worries as I settled in. Kenny let us downstairs and had everything laid out and ready. A small amount of the black and green bud still in the bag, the smell of weed, and a hint of something... irony lingering in the air. He'd pre-rolled an eighth for me and gave me a strong pat on the shoulder. No sense of going in soft, bro. We want to enjoy this. He grinned and handed Kai a stack full of brownies, undoubtedly full of the same stuff, while Kenny helped himself to an ungodly large blunt, passing us a lighter before we each nodded and prepared. I won't lie. I was nervous. Smoking had never been something I cared for, but the combination of wanting to bond with my closest friends and experience something new post-COVID gave me the confidence necessary to push on. See you on the other side, my dudes! Kai grabbed his edible and had two at once, while Kenny and I sparked up and took a deep inhale. And this is where we reached the part of this experience that brings me here. To you. Because I don't know what we smoked, but it wasn't weed. Within 60 seconds, my mouth grew ostensibly dry, my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth, and it felt like a Herculean effort to pry it away. Each of my teeth vibrated, and my jaw wouldn't stop rotating in its socket. It took everything I had to focus and ask Kenny a question, his eyes glistening on something beyond my purview. Where... where did you get this shit? Every consonant sounded cracked, like I was chewing on sandpaper. He didn't shift in his seat as he replied. Didn't move a goddamn muscle, save for his mouth. Guy calling himself the Arbiter. Think he wore a trench coat? Or a hoodie? <laughs> I don't know. But he hit his face and he used one of those... Fucking voice changer things. Said it'd be the ride of my life and that I'd never forget it. And that it changed me for the better. So that was good enough for me. He took another hit and I watched his eyes widen as if something was coming into focus. Just keep going and enjoy the ride. I felt sick. My feet were sinking into the floor and the leather chair was merging with my skin. But I figured it was just jitters and did as instructed. Taking another deep inhale and feeling the heat rush through my chest. A low, incessant hum filled my ears. The kind of electronic boom you hear in movies when the world slows down. The equivalent of my brain sending out signals that enemies are nearby in an RPG. But my body was unable to respond. Instead, all I could do was cast my eyes in Kai's direction. Seeing if he was feeling what I was feeling. Unlikely after just a couple minutes of edibles, right? But it was dark outside by the time my eyes settled on his slumped position across the room. The moon was steadily rising in the window behind him. How long had it been? An hour? Two? Kai was looking at his hands, slowly turning the palms and drooling into his lap. 
a thick green mucus that dangled from his lips and had pulled to a staggering amount on his pants. He fixated on one particular digit, twisting it to find something and extending it out to point at the exact same spot Kenny had been staring at, still drooling and devoid of any kind of expression. Door. <laughs> was all he managed to say before stifled, awkward grunts of laughter escaped his lips. I turned to look and felt the room shift with me. The decor melting away and the roof of the house tearing off to leave us in a space of red and green mist, floating in place. I could still feel the fabric of the leather chair sticking to my skin, threatening to rip the flesh if I so much as twitched too much. I knew my feet were on the floor, but the sensation akin to pins and needles gave a sensation of floating that I fully gave into as I caught on that I'd once again taken a hit. The smell of this weed now the only thing I could perceive. Ty, you see me, man? I blinked and waving my arms around as if I was swimming, my body floating in this strange absence of space. As the shape came into focus, Kenny dashed past me, directing me to a door that Kai was now sitting in front of. Yeah, yeah, I see you, but where, where is this? What is this? He grins. It's a sober and educated grin. He's been here before. Don't worry, man. You're new. Well, follow me through the trip and you'll be fine. Just don't deviate and listen to what I tell you to do, okay? You'll know when you found your door. He puts an arm around me and gives me an encouraging push as I glide down to Kai. And don't bother him. He's working to unlock it for us. As we passed Kai, cross-legged and naked, still drooling, he was clearly focused on something. Eyes rolled back and a jaw slack as a single digit still pointed towards the door, twitching and contorting as if picking an invisible lock. The door itself was grand, standing in this space at a towering 50 feet high. Marvelous sigils and carvings I'd never seen before adorned the sides, coalescing to form a pattern that met in the center with two snakes shaped like doorknobs. Once the door is open, we descend to the next level. You may not remember what you see here, man, but it will change you, bruh. Kenny was proud, hands on hips, and far wiser than I'd ever heard him. It was almost unnerving. This is the best gift I could give you. Kai's only been here once before, but he found his own way in. As will you. What, what did we take, Kenny? What was that? I couldn't shake the fear in the pit of my stomach, and the mist around me shuddered at the question. Kenny grinned. I may have told a little white lie. <laughs> this is a strain, but not of weed. The truth is, I don't know what it fully is. But the guy who gave it to me said it's the ultra high. And he was not wrong. I've actually spent most of the year learning about this place, man. It's given me so much, even if my waking body suffers for it. He paused, shaking his head as he ran a hand across the fine wood of the door, a creaking now joining the low hum. Whatever Kai was doing, it was working. I get headaches, Ty. Start to hear things that aren't there. Muscles ache. Uh, I forget who I am sometimes. And the nose bleeds. Oh, God, the nose bleeds, dude. I can't function out there anymore. So I asked him for the best shit he has to ensure I found the solution here. And, most importantly, showed you what you've been missing out on. <laughs> he chuckled hiding clear discomfort behind pure confidence. Something was here that he wanted. I opened my mouth to speak, but the door swung open and a soft light eked out, bathing us all and making my skin bubble. Kenny took off, pushing his body downwards as if diving into an ocean and past the threshold of the door, a puff of smoke in his wake. Dive in and let your senses guide you, man. Don't deviate from him. You'll find your way, dude. Well, it's not like I could have leave in the middle of a high, I thought. I resigned myself to see this through despite the dread and pushed down until I was hanging on the doorframe, taking one last look back at Kai before I descended. I almost screamed. Stood up, legs splayed out in a low squat, knees buckling under the pressure and eyes fully rolled back into the head, blood seeping from his right nostril. 
He smiled, and while pointing through the door at something impermeable to me, gave a soft wave with his free hand. The flesh rapidly melting from it and revealing the complex nerves and muscles that pushed the digits forward. The flesh was pulling onto the floor and down his leg as he got one single word out. Smell. A force pushed me through the door and hurtling into the cloudy mist within. As I fell through these strange clouds, my body twisting and turning with a flash of colors passing too fast to process, the smell of a barbecue filled my nostrils and my mind. In that moment of nostalgic haze, I wondered to what it must be like to descend through a gas giant, seeing the magnificent colors and smells without the immediate death an otherworldly serenity both familiar and unfamiliar. As soon as the thought came, it left me for a rapidly approaching obsidian black floor. I had just enough time to cover my face as I slammed into it, ribs crunching and the wind knocked out of me. I don't know how pain was a thing in these situations and I was immediately concerned I'd be hurt in the real world, but it gave way to the sight of a prone Kenny at the end of this hallway, whimpering in front of an even bigger door. Colossal statues lie on either side, each in a series of decompositions starting from healthy to exposed bone, and finally, just large skeletons with thick armor pushing down their tired frames. Every one of them directing their gaze at Kenny. Dude, are you okay? I called out, and he immediately jumped out of his skin, turning to me and holding his arms up. He can't hear them. He looked genuinely upset that I had appeared in front of him. That means it won't work. After all, uh, you cannot hear them. You deviated without knowing it. So here we are. I frowned. He'd been the one to push me to do this. To follow him into whatever the fuck this drug trip was. But you said to- I protested, the hum dramatically increasing in volume as the doors began to open and Kenny's breathing grew shallow. They said you'd dare to do this with me, and since I was so far gone out there, a body rotting away from the inside out, I could make it work in here. I just need to get you across the threshold, man. This door is the last one. It has everything I'm looking for. But you... You're going to need to take a different path. You cannot follow me in here. Take Kai with you, if you can. The contents within the door are still impossible to see. They're opening painfully slowly. <laughs> what do you mean? Can't I learn too? We could do this again, just maybe with a lesser strain. I don't know what use it was to reason within a drug-fueled dream, but it felt so real to me. He shook his head. No, man. This door is meant for me. But it seems fate intervened anyway. <laughs> he laughed. It was hollow. Full of bitter irony. When we passed out, I... Ty, I made a mistake. It's costing us right now. I was the last to go out, and before I joined you, the voice that lurks deep within this place... It told me that all that knowledge, that chance to ascend, was right here. But I couldn't go back, man. He turned to look at the statues, the things they all gave up in the pursuit of knowledge. What I want is beyond that door, brah. I can't leave. Not until I know. He tilts his head up to the thick clouds above us. Can't you hear it, Ty? They're just beyond the door. Calling to me. Listen. I tried, straining my ears as best I could to sift through the hum and the creaks. I closed my eyes to help me focus. In that moment, something hissed from the distance. A terrible voice carried on the wind that told of horrible things. Things that it seen, done, and wanted me to do. I snapped my eyes open and felt my heart beating out of my chest, disgust at the forefront of my emotions. Kenny looked at me, a mixture of disappointment and understanding. It's okay. You aren't ready, man. This shit needs practice. Tolerance buildup. They wanted you here because your family's special. Even in this town, everyone knows the McGraws. 
and I thought, I hoped you'd be of good use to them here if you just saw what I saw. Maybe they wouldn't hurt you. We could have both been something great, man. <sighs> he sighed, and his lip trembled, wiping a tear from his eye. But I guess that wasn't meant to be. So I'll take the ascension for us both. Words caught in my throat and the coherent blended into the incoherent seamlessly, as if following the narrative structure of a dream. Key bits of information were being omitted as he stood there, weak smile, and looked me dead in the eye. It's all right, man. We'll meet again. I've sat here for hours, trying to find the words for what I saw when those doors fully opened, and the unholy howls erupted from within its chambers. So many hands, appendages, and undulations sprung from its depths to envelop Kenny. My friend. He smiled, let it happen, and didn't resist as they pulled him in further. I ran forward, my eyes blurring so as not to focus on what I was witnessing, desperate to save my friend, but unable to stop the doors closing on me. I scratched, kicked, punched, and wailed. But the doors would not budge. Within a few minutes, I felt the pulling of my body as it started to rise up and away from the obsidian walkway, away from Kenny, and up through the thick clouds, now stained black and making my eyes water. Back through the first double door, Kai still waving aimlessly. I grab him by the still intact arm and pull him with me as we hurtle towards the starting point of this strange, otherworldly realm. As we look back and see the last set of doors close, the colors shifting from soft greens to bright oranges. All he can croak with fractured vocal cords is one word. Burn. I awoke to the sound of flames licking at the upholstery. Beams of wood cracking under the pressure and splintering to the ground. My head housing a thunderstorm and with every movement my eyes screamed in protest, threatening to burst out of my sockets. When I tried to sit up, a pair of horrific realizations washed over me in tandem. The house was on fire. Kenny's blunt had fallen onto the floor and sparked a flame that rapidly grew throughout the home into a blazing inferno. And secondly, as a result of this, part of my back was fused to the leather chair. I looked to Kai, his hand resting in the flames and almost completely singed to the bone, still catatonic and undoubtedly at risk. I had two minutes at best. I sucked in air, bit down on my lower lip and pushed up with all my weight. A disgusting ripping sound like the tearing of Velcro cut through the air and a wet feeling drenched my back. The pain was indescribable, but I am thankful that adrenaline was there to mask it in that moment. I grabbed the throw blanket we'd had spare for when the night got chilly and threw it over my body, darting round to grab Kai as delicately as I could and heading for the window behind him, breaking it open before hoisting him out, thankful that we were on the ground floor and, at worst, he just hit the bushes with a nasty thud. By the time I'd gotten out, it was impossible to get back in through the window. Racing round to the front door, I pulled out the keys in my pocket and tried desperately to get them open. I scratched, kicked, punched and wailed, but the doors would not budge. Kenny. Kenny, I breathed, staring at the house I'd become so familiar with as it was consumed by the flames. As the distant lights of the fire services and paramedics grew brighter, my body found its cue to let me sink, mercifully, into unconsciousness. This brings us up to speed on what happened. I awoke with some heavy bandaging on my shoulders and was told a skin graft could be needed, but that for today I would need to field some questions about the house fire from a couple of detectives. Sure enough, a couple of men in their 30s saunter in, one in a thick trench coat and the other in a neat three-piece suit, both well-mannered and polite. Your blight. friend Kai Tokugawa hasn't woken up yet, so we can't get his statement. You know what started the fire, Mr. McGraw? I felt the familiar burning on my spine and swallowed, nodding. Yeah, our friend Kenny. 
the guy who owns the house. He lit a cigarette in his hand and fallen asleep. It fell to the floor and... Here we are. I shook my head. Also, we could try some weird weed. <sighs> what a fucking waste. There was no point in hiding it. They'd find out through my medical report anyway. The two of them looked at me quizzically. The man in the trench coat leaned forward. Kenny, who? You co-owned that house with someone? I stared, confused. What? No, that was Kenny's house. I lived on... I... I paused. The image of where I lived prior was blank. As I tried to recall it, all I could see were the grand doors in that strange space. If that's not your house, why'd you have the keys to it? The neighbors said you went out around 10 p.m. the night before. Said you were excitedly telling someone you got some ultra shit. Well, the man in the three-piece suit made a note on his pad, leaving it on my table. I hope it was worth it, kid. Why couldn't I remember where I lived? Why couldn't I remember Kenny's last name? What was going on? The man in the trench coat grinned at me. Was it worth it, Mr. McGraw? Did you like what you saw? We've never seen someone come back from it still... coherent. We're ever so curious about what you encountered in there. Ever so curious. I felt sick. The room started to spin, and the two of them were ushered out as I was calmed down. It's been a few hours, and the men have asked to see me again, this time with some equipment and experimental medication. I have a feeling I know what it is. I don't know what we took. I don't know what happened down there. I haven't seen Kai since this began, and I can no longer remember what Kenny looked like. What, what he sounded like. Fuck! Fuck! Were they even male? I don't know! <sighs> The worst part is the note that the man in the three-piece suit left. I've looked at it multiple times, but every time it makes me feel sick. I can't leave, my body's wrecked, and it's only a matter of time before they come back. Five words accompanied by a strange sketch of an atlas moth beneath it. You have to go back. You know, I never was much of a smoker myself, but I can see the appeal of wanting to commemorate a big day such as 420 with a relaxing session among friends. Though it seems one of Sturgeon's notorious orders have expanded their influence. For those interested, Sturgeon has several, uh, special interest groups within its borders that have their own fanatical views on the inhabitants of both the blighted humans and the folklore nightmare denizens. Some believe in capturing the nightmares and simply eliminating them all. Others believe in serving them and feeding non-blighted humans to them. A clear power dynamic. The moths? Well, they think they can harness them, capture them, control them into doing their bidding. And I don't think this is the last y'all will hear of them. Let's put it that way. Listeners, if you want a primer on the orders or sturgeon itself in between these broadcasts of stories going up, please let me know in the comments and I'll see about putting something together. It would be a joy to educate y'all on the still-growing library of the tales about sturgeon. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them very regularly and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of torment and turmoil, it's just a normal bell, but adding stuff like that is nice. And leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. Just leave them in places where they don't see you. They don't like to be seen. Dedication needs to be rewarded, and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time we give thanks to Haley Clark, Colin Squire, Jason and Gamma, our terrifying twosome at every single premiere, and the ultra-talented Tilly for giving us their valuable time. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of Sturgeon and YouTube, infecting the airways with our intoxicating presence. And when we hit 500, we got something wonderful planned. And, one last time, listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. 
Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them, Dust Cloud will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. As the days recently have shown us, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but there is a lot of work to do. And I'd just like to say, horror is for everyone. This space is for everyone. And I welcome anyone to create something with a similar sounding name to my own. There ain't no place for gatekeeping in this house, and there is always room at the table. Infinite chairs, infinite voices, a delightful chorus of representation, and maybe some screams. Definitely some screams. Drink some water, watch a nature documentary, eat some takeout, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow, and know that you matter, you are loved, every day is another chance. Greet everyone you see with kindness. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle dims. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio, hosted by yours truly, the incorporeal, coruscating, forever wandering every J. Blackwell. Perhaps you know of us, Blackwells. We offer a service called The Way Out for many, many winter solstices. Usually people would just sign up without knowing what it did or where it took them. A way out of debt. A way out of the horrible low-wage job you work because the feds hate the poor. A way to eat the rich. A way out. Why not? Dealer's choice. Nobody ever complained. We show them where to go. I can't tell you for legal reasons or you may try it in your own backyard. <clears throat> uh, library. But they never came back so we can only assume it wasn't an issue. Had to start doing waivers and eventually only the seasonal offering after a bunch of ugh, nihilists got together to do it. It was like watching damn lemons. Being sad all the time isn't cool, you know. And furthermore, Nietzsche loved life, you dang surface level enthusiasts. Sheesh. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted. Interesting and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some, uh, oh, uh, TJ is tapping at my window. Yes, hi, I, I see you, TJ. All hail. Are you gonna do something gross and weird? He's shaking his head. He's not wearing his janitor overalls today either. He's dressed normally? I don't understand. TJ, is this an elaborate bit so you can gain my favor, sympathy, and trust before flipping the script in a comical and yet aloof manner in order to further the dichotomy between us and the lovable dynamic of opposites attract that has been played out in almost every literary setting for 200 years? He's shaking his head. No. He looks annoyed at me. In my defense, TJ, you have given me reason to doubt you. You smeared purple crown over your teeth for fun. You killed our last HR manager and placed his head in your nest above my desk for two weeks as you observed me. You made a purple crayon wife. And just last month, you caused an uprising and declared yourself king janitor for life. Though I don't know why your ambitions stopped there, but still. Now, you've interrupted my flow long enough. What is it you want? He's mouthing something and pointing to my desk. Check your notes. Ah. Okay, it's it's his story. I suppose you want to come in? He's nodding. Well, I guess we'd best ready ourselves for a bait and switch. All right, this next story is called I Bought My Wife a Life Extension Plan and is another entry in the Tales from Sturgeon. Now, for those unfamiliar... DJ Lee has been chronicling the events of our fine city for some time now, starting with the smaller tales as we work our way up to the grander ones. You may have heard some of them already over on Rom Nexus channel, where she did a full reading of TJ's debut novella and the first arc in the Sturgeon universe, The Last City Eater. She's also done the Tortoises and Tarot series 
or maybe over on Dark Somnium's channel, you'll remember when he chronicled the spaces in between, the second arc in that universe, also known as the Bar series. Either way, you're in good hands here, and this tale seems to be a personal one. TJ's motioning to me for the mark. He seems sincere, so I guess I'll let him have it. But don't think this is a regular thing, TJ. I have my anti crayon spray at the ready if you try anything funny. Thanks, Everett. Hi, everybody. TJ Lee here, and when I am not eating purple crayons and making a mess of the janitor's closet, I am normally writing stories for this channel, doing voice acting, or uh, just general upkeep of the channel. And um, I wanted to take a moment to get real with you on this particular story that I wrote, known as the Life Extension series. Uh, this was written from a very personal place. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I am uh, dealing with a very uh, unique illness at the moment. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, what it is. Um, it, it's pretty serious and we need to figure out what's going on with that. Um, and uh, my father is uh, terminally ill and uh, we are currently going through the sort of um, uh, next stages of his, uh, his care. And this came from a very very personal place and I wanted to address all of you personally about it because I don't want this to be misconstrued as just a fictitious whimsical adventure. Uh, it is very personal. It does have some triggering aspects in terms of how we deal with death and loss and st stuff like that and obviously um, a lot of us are dealing with that especially in the world we live in now um, and this is the one time you will uh, hear me breaking the fourth wall um, just because of how much this means to me. Um, because Dusk Night Radio has become a... It is, honest to God, become a place that I feel so happy to come and work with and cultivate. Um, creating this this radio station and, and, and pulling it uh, from the ashes and uh, giving Everett life. And uh, the community has made this one of the most rewarding and gratifying experiences. And um, it is down to the community. And I just wanted to thank all of you. Um, for trusting me um, and trusting in this in this um, unique idea uh, that I have put forward. Um, I actually think some of you were uh, unaware that Everett and myself are the same person, so sorry. Uh, you can just pretend this didn't happen, but um, Dusklight is my baby. Um, if you love my work and you want to support it, um, please check out my podcast, The Writer's Mythos. That is uh, my other baby I am very passionate about, and I would love to grow the listenership on it. Um, it is a historical podcast that looks at the writers um, from history. We bring in uh, great voice actors. Um, we work in partnership with the No Sleep Podcast, uh, who are just the, the best fucking people to work with in the world. Um, we've had people on there uh, like Peter Joseph Lewis, who is working with Jeff Goldblum on The Dark Dice. Um, which is a great podcast. Um, we've had Erica Sanderson, who, if you've heard The Last City to you, I've heard it from that. She's been in a lot of productions. We've had Mary Murphy, who's done work for Disney. We've had Mick Winger, who's worked as Slappy the Doll on the Goosebumps movie. We've got a lot of really cool people. Um, and uh, that is that is a, a big uh, passion of mine, and I would love to grow that alongside Dusklight. Um, and uh, the other thing, if you um, want to follow more on my stuff, my Twitter, TJ Lee. And of course, last but not least, the last Sunita book, it has just come out. Um, I will be starting up the pre-order drives again for the spaces in between, the next book in the Sturgeon universe, um, and I will be promoting it here. Occasionally you'll hear from me. Um, but uh, this was just my moment to get on my soapbox because of how personal this story is to me. Um, I don't want anyone to think I'm um, I I'm kicking the bucket anytime soon. As far as I know, I'm not. But I wanted to let you guys know that this story would have never been fully realized without you and my community on uh, my subreddit, r slash TJ Lee, which just surpassed 3,000 subs, which is just incredible. I love all of you. Um, I'm going to hand the reins back over to Everett, and I'm going to go back to making my purple crayon wife. And um, just remember, guys, uh, we only have so much time in the world. Um, it is important that we spend it uh, doing the things we love and putting more positivity into the world than, um, than we found it in. And um, go with everything in life with the passion that you show um, to each other, which I think makes sense, but probably doesn't. Okay, Purple Crown Wife time. Love you guys. Enjoy. I... Uh, mm. Listeners, I, I caught most of that, but it went all fuzzy when he started talking about me. 
like my head was full of old phone cords and internet dial tones from the 90s. But either way, it seems our king janitor for life was serious, and you know what? I'll respect that. Loss is a tough thing for anyone, and when you're half dead like me, you see many people pass and wonder when it'll be your turn. If you haven't noticed yet, this is our longest transmission so far. A regular dust glide of the movies type deal, so get comfortable, make sure to stretch if you need to, and drink some water. You can find more of TJ's work on his subreddit r slash TJ Lee, his Twitter, at TJ Lee, and for more on Sturgeon, there's a playlist linked below with all of the adapted stories on YouTube, as well as the entire two-year saga so far on No Sleep in reading order. I'd be grateful if you considered purchasing his debut novella, The Last Senior, over on Amazon. The second arc, The Spaces in Between, which has been adapted with new material, is now available for pre-order, releasing July 23rd. A new novella every two months from now until the story is done. Oh boy, I hope that boy sleeps. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Next, Dustlight bows to the altar of Trevor Henderson, the man behind Siren Head, for allowing Dustlight to use some of the images he's captured of various abominations. Our cast today features our purple prince of perpetual pestilence, TJ Lee, all hail his janitorial wisdom, and the wonderful Romnex as the pod of Amelia. And, of course, lest we forget, some of the music you hear in our videos is provided by the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the lot is on. It's time to walk towards it. The first month. Overcast, mild temperature. An owl turns its head to stare through our window as we awaken. It was 8.58 a.m. on a Tuesday, and once again it was the sounds of violence seizing on the floor by my bed that awoke me. Stumbling in a stupor to cradle my wife's head and soothe her as eyes rolled into the back, joints locked and pulled while her mouth was foaming, it was tough to say the least. Finding the opening in her mouth to administer her rescue medication, Mida Zolum, watching the paste coat her gums and hoping that it'll settle her while assuring her I loved her and didn't want to hurt her, was always harder. Then came the grunts, the dismal groaning as her back arched and her shoulders rolled before her breathing grew slower, labored, and she entered a state not dissimilar to dreaming, but without waking up. Blue flashing lights, paramedics gently moving me aside to administer oxygen and prepper for moving to the ambulance. The long drive to the hospital, the slow but steady come around with confusion and the doctors with well-meaning smiles and pats on the shoulder, assuring me in a calm, collected, and still distant tone, you're doing the best you can, given the circumstances. Somewhere in that hospital ward, I would always see a flicker of something in the darker parts of the halls. Shadows clinging to the last vestiges of darkness that the powerful fluorescent lights could not reach. Never enough to warrant panic, but plenty to invite dread into my body and let it nestle there while I smiled, thanked the doctor and packed up my wife's things, knowing I'd be back again before long. Knowing it'd only get worse from here. Amelia... My wife is sick. That much is obvious to you all by this point. We'd been having a spirited nerf war in our newly purchased home as a newly hitched couple, fully within the throes of love and a honeymoon phase of our relationship that had lasted seven and a half blissful years so far. Some people say it doesn't last that long. I beg to disagree. She lost her footing, 
stumbled and slurred something before smashing her skull on the coffee table and seizing on the floor. For as long as I live, I will not forget the image of her face frozen in total neutrality as her brain bled, nor the sound her skull made as it collided with the mahogany. Doctors would conclude it was a stroke, but the genuine horror lay in their subsequent tests. The stern faces, the high-quality scans showcasing a highlighted mass gripping into the soft flesh of her brain. Amelia has glioblastoma. Aggressive glioblastoma. It grows silent, muted in the office as we listen to the doctor run through options of treatment and palliative care. She talks about various kinds of radiotherapy, surgeries with enormous risks and pills to manage the suffering. I can read the lips, but the tone escapes me. A hum has crept into the room, and a darkness fills the corner of my vision, like someone is pouring oil into my eye sockets. I feel something put stiff hands on my shoulders, and my skin bristles. Before I can react, Amelia's hand is in mine as she speaks. No, I won't be needing treatment. We'll do this our own way. Thank you. She stands up, gently nods in our doctor's direction, and heads for the door. I see the doctor's glasses fog over, and he grabs my wrist suddenly as I leave, his bottom lip trembling as he extends a small card. Look, if she doesn't want our treatment, fine. But you can still do something for her. See this woman. She's from our extensions branch. Maybe she can help. I don't have the ability to respond, so I merely nod, place the card in my pocket, and take her soft hand as we exit the office. My eyes fixated on her hair tied into blonde and pink space buns as she walks with purpose in her step, humming to herself. You know, it's funny what you focus on when the world falls around you, but it doesn't grant you respite from the uncomfortable truth laid bare before you. Amelia has mere months to live. My wonderful, kind, one-of-a-kind wife has months to live. The second month. Dark clouds, rain batters the windows, failing to deter a black beetle that crawls across our windowsill. Steadfast in his job that remains unknown to us. His iridescent shell glistening in the faint light of my bedside cabinet, gripping a small twig in its mandibles. I carefully pick him up and deposit him into an old shoe until the rain passes. Dedication should always be rewarded. That's what they say, right? Everyone talks about how their loved one lights up a room when they walk in, is the life of the party, or some other extroverted phrase. But that has never been Amelia. She has always been a woman with two sides to herself. The calm, collected, and dignified side that the outside world sees. One where she can keep people at arm's length and ensure she never has to be more than the wallflower if she so wishes. Then there's the side I, her family, and limited loved ones knew. The rambunctious, witty, eccentric woman who spent her time going through phases of interest in so many subjects that it makes an ordinary guy like me have his head spinning. From cryptozoology to agriculture and Roman history, Amelia dove in head first and allowed herself to be absorbed by the rich tapestry of knowledge. Regaling me with all her findings during the day, and sometimes even acting out fun plays or activities from the time periods and subjects by night. It was never a dull moment with her. The first year I met her, she was a lover of surrealist films, art, and music. We bonded over my Twin Peaks hat and a love of the vocalist Mike Patton. Spent our first date watching a razor head before she took my hands in hers and told me, This is it, Jasper. I no longer need to search. And by God, if I didn't believe her. I want you to understand who she is. I need you to understand who she is what she means to me. Because otherwise, I fear my decision making the past nine months will not be fully appreciated, or worse, scorned. That first month involved a lot of pent-up emotions on my end and stoic optimism on hers. She was always a spiritual person who obstinately believed that, while there was no particular god who would answer her prayers, that we didn't come to Sturgeon for nothing, and that she trusted in the powers that be to determine what would happen next. Easy for her to say when she wasn't the one witnessing the steady decline of the one she loved. 
countless days spent watching her muscles weaken, her cognitive abilities grow worse, and her memory falter. Never did I think I'd be telling my 32-year-old wife that I was her husband and not an intruder she needed to fear, nor a teacher coming to discipline her for not being at school. Those nights were the hardest on us both. I slipped out one evening when her diazepam had knocked her out, and while sobbing in the car, punching my steering wheel as the heavy rain muffled my screams, I remembered the card I'd been given. Black with red velvet letters that danced off the beautifully crafted stationery. A small lotus flower on one side, a painted skull on the other. A simple question adorning the top of the card. Do you want more time? I swallowed, wiping my face free of tears and scoffing at the notion. Who doesn't? Beneath the question was an address and the title of the business. Dr. D. D.'s Life Extension Service, a proud subsidiary of St. Martin's Hospital. Finally, what I assume was the motto with an official medical seal affixed at the end. Moments are finite, but memories are infinite. That was all I needed in order to make the trip. I had nothing else to lose. I took one look out the window at the silent bedroom where my wonderful wife slept, hopefully peacefully. I called my mother-in-law and asked her to keep him watch. Said I had to make up a pickup for Amelia's new meds and jet it off into the night. The trip is a blur. I spent the entire time with fingers drumming the steering wheel to a beat only I could hear. Lights flashing by like checkpoints in a race course as I hurtled down the main roads until a small sign jutted out of an intersection. Myopic Road, South. Sturgeon Central, Northwest. Dr. D. D.'s Life Extension Service, East. Two miles. Turning my car into the dimly lit street, I knew that no matter what I encountered or trials that I faced, it would be worth the effort. If it means giving Amelia more time, anything was. The converted shipping container sat in the center of a large clearing that I assume was once a parking lot. Rust still steadily overtook the sides of the structure, white paint interspersed with bright red lettering and a neon sign flashing its availability kept the building and parking area lit. But the greater area was still enshrouded in a thick darkness that felt far too imposing for its own good. Still, I was determined, and no amount of threatening aura would deter me. I parked up and stepped towards the small door fixed to the side like a sewn-on appendage. A splinterless wooden material with black and gold patterns swirling in on themselves, coalescing at the center where a peephole and a large knocker sat. I sighed against the cold air and lifted it to knock before the door swung open and a man beamed at me from behind a pair of circular sunglasses and a modified plate mask. Ah! Oh, you're here for the pierogi! His voice was soft, enthusiastic, pleasant, and inviting. The smell of cinnamon and ginseng wafting from the interior. Uh, no, I'm here for... Oh, of course. Nobody's ever here for the pierogi anymore. Mrs. Langston always gets the most customers. That's the last time I ever share a recipe in the community amateur cooking group, let me tell you. He sighs and ushers me in. I know what you're here for, Mr. Lambert. Come on in and sit in any seat you like. He hastily shut the door behind me before hurrying off to the far end of the container where a stack of shelves and books sat, before I could even ask him how he knew. Instead, I turned my attention to the consultation area he'd compiled where, predictably, just one chair sat opposite his own. Oh, what is your spouse's affliction? He called, muttering occasionally. No, not that one. Hmm. Maybe this? while busy hands rummaged for unseen concoctions. I realized I hadn't even said it out loud to another soul since she got diagnosed. Glioblastoma, stage four. She has, at best, three months. The words spilled out of my mouth like ash, the bitterness on my tongue enough to make me vomit with anger. Hmm, I see. What makes your wife happiest? He held a blue beaker up to the light and something behind his thick circular shades glistened before he shrugged and cast it aside. When I didn't know how to respond, he tilted his head back. This works if I understand your connection. I mean, really understand it. So please, humor me. Well, I mean, she loves to travel. Strawberry ice cream, rainy days, and... No, 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 no. 
What makes her truly happy? This is your wife, not a bio on a corporate profile. I thought for a moment, and my legs started shaking. <laughs> Nowadays, it's the first precious minutes or hours before sickness overwhelms her. Or she can think, be coherent, be her normal self. And when she wakes up, she's strong enough in mind and body to cut her bonsai tree in peace. She spends time with her lizards, and she even talks to them. She's not burdened by the pain, the vomiting, or the notion of at any given moment she could drop to the floor and into a world where she's alone, vulnerable, and unable to get help. Her happiness comes from the luxury of not thinking about death for a time. But... But before... I could see the image burned in my head. Not a memory, but a moment that would never come to pass. An event so desperate to bring itself into existence, and yet undeniably so far from my grasp. Before, there was the prospect of becoming a mother. I swallowed and felt shards puncture my throat. I hated this. The doctor found what he was looking for and with a book in hand walked over to the desk, placing the potion and book down in front of me as he sighed. Ah, oh, I see. And what would you give up to ensure that happiness endures? He placed his hands together in front of me pensively and studied me as I shifted in my seat. Anything. I would give up anything to see her better. To have more time and carve out a niche for us. I'm not ready. She's not ready. He tilted his head to the side and tapped his index fingers together. And you're sure? Have you discussed this with her? I don't think I need to point out that this extension plan is not orthodox, Mr. Lambert. Nothing in Sturgeon is orthodox, Doc. But no, I haven't discussed it with her. Right now, Amelia can't tell day from night some days. The others are spent keeping it together long enough to make those good days mean something. She doesn't need any more to add to her plate. It's my job to help her, and that's what I'll do. Come hell or high water. There was a pause. His hands lowered, and he opened the thick leather tome to a specific page, turning it towards me and gesturing for my hand. Upon handing it to him, he pricked my finger. Last question. What scares you, Jasper? His hands were ice cold. And he didn't release his grip on my wrist, but a steeled resolve and months of emotional toil had taken their toll. I knew coming here was a risk. Nothing except for losing her before we're ready, I replied flatly. His cheekbones rose, and I could sense a smile behind the mask as he let go and gestured to look at the book. It was a life extension contract. Once you sign on that dotted line, you will fear everything. If you wish to extend Amelia's life, you will give up your sense of security. This contract lasts for one month, and during that time, she will feel reinvigorated and will appear well. But once you reach the 30th day, she will deteriorate once more, and your time will be up. That should be enough time to sort out your affairs. But if it's not, well, <laughs> we can renegotiate. And perhaps you'll want some pierogi, then. What did I have to lose? A month of normalcy and a chance to do everything we wanted? How could I turn that down for something as inconsequential as my own fears? No price was too high. I signed, and he snapped the book shut, startling me in my seat and staring for a moment, leaning down and peering into my eyes. Was he always that tall? This imposing? What did he see when he looked at me? I felt like a guinea pig in a lab, ready to be pricked and prodded for all manner of horrible things, and sweat started to run down my brow in those tense few moments before the hidden smile flashed up on his cheekbones, and he handed me a vial of blue liquid. Good. Our contract has begun, and this is what you'll need. Simply add it into whatever immediate drinks or eats, and you'll see the results within the hour. While you'll feel the effects immediately, Hers will not start until after ingestion. I'll even be kind and wait until she's eaten it to start the month. But only if you take my pierogi recipe. <laughs> he held up a finger and chuckled. Why was he so obsessed with his food? Did he... Did he do 
do something to it? Oh, what's in this recipe? My stupid mouth blurted out before I could stop my tongue wagging, and he laughed harder. I'm sure to him it was jovial and pleasant, but it screamed malice to me. <laughs> oh, oh, that'd be telling. He wagged his finger and said goodbye as I hurried for the door, the black void outside no more inviting than his workshop of horrors. What unseen monsters lurked in the dark waiting to get me? Even as I ran to the car some thirty feet away, I felt invisible hands reach out to grab at my shirt, pull at my ankles, and tear at my skin just for a bite of my flesh. But they never caught up. No, I'm too fast for that. I locked my doors and raced home to beat the sunrise, triple bolting the front door and checking every window upon arrival, and putting the blue liquid into Amelia's morning juice. Here's hoping I didn't just give up more than I could afford for nothing in return. The third month. Clear skies exposing a scorching sun, bright rays seeping through the window with a soft breeze bringing the smell of barbecues and log fires on the wind. In the nearby lake, a crane bird flies down to take a drink. Something emerges from a wound on its throat, pushing at the slit to get free. It feels like it's looking at me. In the foreground, a sea of black clouds roll in, bringing with them a sense of intense dread. And despite the dread, the sun's presence would not be denied, and the familiar warmth it brought was just as much a comfort. What shocked me out of my trance was the door being kicked in, a deafening boom that shattered my eardrums and set my heart into overdrive. The fear of someone coming to take me away from Amelia, or worse, take Amelia to a home and away from my care, a place for her to die alone and afraid. Instead, as frantic eyes turned towards the door to see my attacker, I only see Amelia. She's fully dressed, dungarees with one strap down exposing a colorful polka dot top, and her beautiful hair cascading down her shoulders, the tops of her fringe held up by a pair of oversized goggles and her favorite chameleon Gustav on her shoulder. She was beaming at me with the most boyish grin I'd ever seen on her, a nerf gun pointed directly at me. Wake up, maggot! The sun is shining and it's time for a nerf war! It's a new day, yes it is! She giggled and I felt my heart swell with joy as fear gave way to adulation. She was better. And it worked. I pushed innate fears down into my core and forced a smile as I leapt out of bed, grabbing a Nerf gun and giving her a 30-second head start. <laughs> 29 years old and I still acted like a child hopped up on sugar. But I guess that's what love is at its core, feeling perpetually young. I heard her dash away, bare feet slapping against the cedar flooring as she found a tactical advantage. Within a few seconds, the house fell silent. Traipsing through the house and spying any vantage points, I began to see the home I'd lived in with her for years in a completely different light. Maybe it was the lack of natural lighting. Perhaps I was still tired. But I did not recall there being so many imposing structures and shapes in my living room. A code rack shaped like a twisted, elongated facsimile of a man his arms pulling at his own spine, his jagged feet stuck out in a menacing attempt to catch me, but frozen in time. The creaks and groans of the house settling, now akin to the grumblings of a stomach possessed by an ancient, malignant creature that wanted nothing more than to digest this whole. But it was the shape behind the curtains that caught my attention most. Bulbous and plump, it danced behind the fabric and invited me to investigate further, beckoning me with giggles punctuated with wheezes sounded wrong. The lump in my throat threatened to choke me from the tension, and I had no choice but to move forward. Shaking, hand outstretched to grab the fabric and yank it aside, I felt a sharp pang in my back and howling laughter from behind me as Amelia doubled over and ran off, daring me to catch her. When I turned back, the curtain had returned to its normal shape. I 
stood there. Dumbfounded for a moment as my fear dampened and a tension headache took its place. Amelia walked up to put her hand on my shoulder and the other against my forehead. Her boyish smile faded and was replaced with concern. Hey, you feeling okay? I know that's funny for me to ask, but... I said nothing. How could I? This was not my moment to need care and sympathy. This was hers, and she deserved every ounce of it. But that didn't change the overwhelming dread still swirling in my skull, looking for an exit strategy and the exhaustion cozied up with it. I didn't realize how utterly tired I was until I truly took in the events around me, playing games with my terminally old wife who, not three days prior, had been bedridden and unable to tell me what year it was. I pulled her in for a long hug and sobbed into her shoulder. She soothed me, running her hands through my hair and whispering reassurances as I apologized for my own perceived weakness. It's all right. It's really me. I guess these meds worked wonders, huh? Let's just enjoy the time we have, okay? I nodded and let her calming smell linger, steadying my body even as the energy dissipated from me. I know. I just wish... We had more time. All things crawl into hell's mouth eventually, Jasper. It's just a matter of how much you season the meat first. <laughs> Something pushed its way into my ear, hot, slimy, and burning at my flesh as I pushed with everything I had to get away. Unable to fully break free, my eyes are directed towards the floor where Amelia's feet stand. But the decay, rot, and bloated flesh peering back up at me barely resembled the maintained and dainty feet of my wife. These were clearly belonging to that of a corpse, the nails yellowing and peeling away from the toes, bone pushing up to the thinning skin with such force it splits the flesh. Before I could press my fingers against the rot to consider my own sanity, my body failed me, and the world faded to black. When I next awoke, it was to the darkness of the bedroom and a cold rag on my head. Amelia told me I passed out and had a fever, but she was happy to have the roles switched for once. I couldn't even speak for the pain. Just hearing her talk was enough to soothe me. Eventually the fever would break, and I finally allowed the impossible to set in with one question. Amelia, what do you want to do with the time we have? She stopped what she was doing and looked at me with all the warmth and love a human being could muster, as if she'd been given the keys to the kingdom. Spend it like it's going out of style. So it went. 29 days of doing the things we knew she couldn't do before and would struggle to do after. We binged the later series of Twin Peaks and found it wanting. We traveled to the edge of Sturgeon after hearing rumors of the best damn gelato you'll get in this or any other dimension. We evened our nerf war score and vowed the war would continue on. We loved unconditionally and without fear of what came after for three glorious weeks. As I got more comfortable, I could deny all the things of the corners of my vision. I could shrug off the night terrors when I awoke in her arms and knew she was safe. Anger was no longer a source of comfort in quiet nights of pontificating over her condition. Now, it was replaced with contentment. Then, on the morning of the thirtieth day, she began slurring her words again. By the afternoon, her balance was waning, and she fell into my arms some inches from the doomed coffee table that her skull collided with previously. When dinner came around, she forgot how to cook a steak and nearly burned herself in the process. Shame written across her face as she slumped away to bed and cried. As the night gave way to dawn and we reached day 31, she had a seizure. The dream was shattered, and we were once again back where we started. But now with the added pain of what could have been ripped away to expose a fresh, and sensitive wound, throwing the fear of everything around me, and I was at breaking point. I looked at her in bed, a fragile thing with her face looking closer to 42 than 32 as her body tried and failed to fight off the damage being wrought from within. She was decaying before my very eyes 
And that scared me more than any door slam, errant tree branch looking like a malformed fist or strange thing floating in my eye. There was no other option. You have to understand that. I had to go back to Dee Dee's and renegotiate the extension plan. It didn't matter that every tree on my frantic drive there seemed to lean forward, the night sky becoming less visible, a tunnel of bark with me none the wiser to what's on the other side. It didn't matter that whispers that had been lingering in my ears for weeks were now subdued shrieks and threats of what will happen if I continue to ignore them. It didn't matter that something was hiding behind every single telephone pole, and I was catching more of its shape with every glance behind me as the road thinned out. All that matters is Amelia. You do the same in my shoes, right? Even if the next three months were hell. The fourth month. Hail spits from the skies and thunder claps sound like great oaks crashing around my home. Giant footsteps tentatively growing closer and threatening to uproot my home at a moment's notice. The second I let my guard down and take Amelia to the depths of the blackened skies, I see a snake in the underbrush outside my yard, biting on its tail. I call my dad and after some apologizing for the late night inconvenience, he agrees to watch over Amelia while I go to renegotiate. I could see the sympathy written across the smile lines in his aged face. Forever an empathetic man, he was good too to turn for advice. But not for this. Son, you need to go somewhere to, you know, blow off steam and let it all out. You know what's healthy, right? No one will judge you. He trails off as we stand in my living room, putting my shoes on and takes a sip from his water man shouldn't watch his true love go like this. Not so soon. I know, Dad. But I know she can beat this. She can get better. Even just for a little while. He looks at me quizzically. I tie the knots with an added sense of determination. Jasper, when it's time, it's time. You know, I've got some pamphlets on how to cope. There's this one that talks about the Kubler-Ross, and I think you're at stage... I stand up and hear my voice crack when I retort, the words acidic in my throat as they ooze past my lips. I know what fucking stage I'm at. I'm at the stage of doing whatever it takes to make that woman as comfortable as possible for as long as possible. Are you going to help me or not? There was a silence, the weight of the words hanging in the air and fall on my dad's shoulders as he considers his response. Instead. He simply pulls me in for a hug and pats my back. I get it, kid. A man's business is his own, and a good father or husband will always look out for his family. So when I tell you I'm here for you, warts and all, he pulls away and presses his forehead against mine, his composure waning. I mean it. Do what you gotta do and come back here to help that amazing little lady. I don't hear him the first time. My eyes shift to the divider connecting the living room to my kitchen, the fridge door opening. Why are there teeth in my fridge? No, wait. It's a mouth. A fucking bright red mouth. Tongue rolling out and exposing a fiery pit in the impossible blackness. And this is where it all ends, Jasper. Your defiance has consequences. A formless voice echoes around me, my skin bubbling and every hair standing on end. It felt wrong. Amelia will never go to such an ugly place. I won't allow it. I breathe, my dad not moving as everything seems to be frozen safe for the hell mouth that was once my fridge. It laughs, a hoarse, reptilian cackle that makes my eyes vibrate in their sockets. The fridge mouth forms a head around it. 
red eyes and black fur with piercing fangs that protrude to the point of disbelief. Small, spectral shapes funnel into the mouth, poked and prodded by an unseen tormentor. <laughs> It is not her who shall venture into the jaws of the beast, but you. She will watch your body crush in its mighty jaws. It mocks, the mouth growling and filling me with an unspeakable dread, letting me know that this was a fight or flight moment. I shut my eyes, holding my dad for a moment and praying it past me. It's for Amelia. I will suffer whatever the world holds to be for her. A mantra I would keep in mind no matter what happened, terrified of what would happen when the words grew hollow. I counted back from ten, steadying my breathing. She will die alone and afraid, kicking and screaming. Seven seconds. I could feel a low hum run through my flesh and puncture my muscles. Something was moving towards me. You will never know how scared she was. Why? Three seconds. It's hot. Fetid breath bristled against my cheeks. It smelled of rot, lard, and sage. Because that's what will hurt you the most. I snapped my eyes open and found myself looking into my dad's kind eyes. A moment hadn't passed for him. I swallowed and backed away, nodding in appreciation and reluctant to share what I'd seen. I'm going to go and check in on her once before I go, I mumbled, running hands over tired eyes to wipe away sleep and unseen tears. Sure enough, she was fast asleep and heavily medicated, small chest rising and falling rhythmically as her eyes fluttered. I was thankful for her lack of awareness at this moment, at least. One last glance at the fridge as I head outside, just for my own sake. It was normal, save for a small line running down the door looking not dissimilar to a claw mark. I found coping mechanisms as time went on to deal with the majority of my anxieties. I suppose most people do when they're under immense stress. Thankfully, mine weren't too damaging. Music and podcasts tended to be where my mind gravitated towards. And I'm told the former holds great sway over the minds here in Sturgeon. You can't find a heartfelt moment without some accompanying tunes, passersby would remark. I suppose it's a good cushion, in a way. Finding solitude in the crooning of a musician who sings about their own pains and struggles. We connect with their pain and in some way imagine it's our own being shared. I lose myself to the dulcet tones on the radio before pulling up Aditi's, hammering on the door despite mounting concern of what I'd find inside. It's open, Jasper. Let yourself in. I'm a little preoccupied right now. That silky smooth voice was almost melodic in tone as I pushed on the latch and walked into the dark room filled with strange chemical lighting. On the large table opposite his apothecary was a strange, writhing beast. It hissed as I shut the door and set me with my back against the wall in shock. Beady black eyes fixed on me as a barbed tongue lashed around its head and a mass of red fur kicked the body. Small but powerful limbs fastened to the table. Dee Dee looks up at me, and his cheekbones rise again as he relishes in my fear. The circular lenses around his eyes fog up with heavy breaths as he pulls on his leather gloves and reaches for something under the table. Ah, oh, don't mind Meridu here. He's been rather... He stabs the creature in the chest with a hypodermic needle and pushes on the plunger. A faint breeze leaves the beast's mouth as his limbs grow limp and eyes fade. Uncooperative. But the job is a job. Hopefully the baking club will be too upset with me. I feel the sweat run down my brow as I try to mouth the words why amid a sea of confusion. He picks up on it before I can intonate the words and sets about finding a potion on his vast bookshelf. Well, sometimes people have disagreements, and sometimes those who feel wronged may make a pact with a creature that feeds off of negative energy until it can eat the withered husk that remains. Those people are dicks. Meridu here. He turns around and pries the creature's massive jaws apart, pouring a thick gunk down his gullet and forcing the mouth closed as the beast thrashes in protest. He wasn't meant to be. I may be a fan of the Baker's Club and, in my humble opinion, the most experienced among them, but 
I have a job to do, and that involves getting this delightful fellow back to where he belongs, in the cozy enclosure of the Dusk Light Circus. The body relaxes, and he places a sleeping cap over its eyes, seeing my shaken up form and gesturing to the usual spot on the table, chuckling. <laughs> also, I wanted to see how your life with fear was faring with you. I take it you want to extend the deal, Jasper? Unsteady legs took me to the chair, and I awkwardly nodded as he pulled out the great ledger from before, flicking through on an expedient pace. I could still make out small indentations of clientele and number affixed to each person, a concoction in bold letters. How many deals had he made? Jasper, I am but a simple cook and problem fixer. Some call it dark magical potion selling, but all I offer is time. Temporary time. He put his finger next to my name and tapped. You are free to extend the negotiation, of course, but it comes with additional terms. I must warn you of what awaits you. He sighs and walks to his window, staring out at the supermoon bathing Sturgeon in a faded yellow glow. <sighs> Is she worth it, Jasper? Is this what she would want? His voice soft, sympathetic filled with empathy and a hint of curiosity. I, I... I don't think she'd want to go yet. But is she worth it? What kind of question is that? She's worth everything! I felt my back straighten up and my chest puff out involuntarily. Just the notion that she somehow wasn't worth this was beyond my comprehension. It was offensive. Whatever you need to do, whatever you need to add to this, I don't care. We need more time. I can't stand to see her suffer like this, Doc. There has to be something, anything. But don't you ever imply she's not worth it. I'd rather live the next 40 years of my life in crippling fear with her than a single day without. He doesn't turn towards me, but I can sense he's satisfied with my answer as I slump back in the chair, still exhausted. They've started talking to you, haven't they? He sighed. You're becoming a conductor for them, and they're only going to get stronger and bolder the longer you're aware of them, you know. I don't care. They can't have Amelia. They never will. I was defiant. Steadfast in that much. He shook his head. Jasper, they're not coming to take her away because she is dying. They're not body snatchers. They're coming for you because you're now a threat to them. It dawns on him at this moment that I don't have a clue what he means. He grabs a small book and pulls it open. Thumbing through the pages until he comes across a photo of a towering man with his arm outstretched, a helm made of bone and gold adorning his head. His torso covered by a toga, but the myriad of faces fixed in expressions of pain, pleasure, and rage impossible not to notice. You took something from their king, something he was owed, and now he has sent his followers after you to protect his standing. People are not supposed to defy the natural order, Jasper. Who? Who is he? I breathed, staring at him, filling me with dread. Nurgle, god king of the sunset and ruler of one of the underworlds of pestilence. I suppose he's gotten wise to my services and has sought to put things right in his own day. If you go down this road, Jasper, it will bring you pain. He sat back down and turned the book over, a small needle with which to prick my finger and the concoction sat by his side. Make sure this is what you want. Because to extend it again, I will need now to take your sense of ignorance. I will make you see more of what you're not supposed to see. Will I be... safe? I feel my neck tighten and my mouth go dry. He smiles again. No, but you'll be happy. Isn't that the point? He pulls a small charm from his pocket and puts it around my neck. It's old and heavy, but it feels comforting. So long as you keep this on you, they will not be able to physically harm you. Everything else is up to you. He shakes his head. Tutting. Sixty days. That's all I can give you. Two months? But what? 
Because by the end of it, come hell or high water, you will beg me to cease the contract and life will go on. He was blunt. To the point. Detached. I want you to come back in one month to check in, see where your head is at. With any luck, you'll want to end things early. I signed before he could finish, knowing that I would savor every day I had with Amelia, even if my arms were torn from my body. I appreciate this, Doc. Amelia is going to be so happy. I just know it. My head buried in the book. I didn't notice the light changing in the room. Do me a favor, Jasper. Don't look at the moon when you leave. Better yet, don't look at it at all tonight. Now that you're unable to filter things or ignore them, it may be a little... much for you. You might not like what you see. I finished and attempted to quiz him on what he meant, but the light emanating from the window stopped me dead in my tracks and had me standing up on instinct. A sickly green had replaced the familiar yellow and was pulsating rhythmically, as if signaling to something. To me. The last man who saw through the veneer of Sturgeon's barriers separating us from them had looked to the stars and realized the truth. I don't think you're quite ready for the same thing. So no matter what you hear, do not look at the moon. Understand? He kept his hands behind his back and returned to staring wistfully at it, letting his mind wander. It is beautiful, though. By word. What do you see when you look at it, Doc? He paused. Something in him twitched. Unnatural. Wrong. Everything. He responded, dryly. Good luck, Jasper. Do watch your step on the way out. Our guest might wake up. I took a sideways glance to Meridu, unmoving on the table, tongue still lazily swaying off the side, unfocused eyes staring in my direction. The drive home was tense. No music or podcasts. I just kept talking about the night sky and how the glow was good for the skin, especially when naked. They suggested we should all be naked in its magnificent glow and, if possible, grab other people to do it too. They started describing it, but the words turned to static in my ears and eventually I just switched it off. It'll be fine. It's all for Amelia. I'll suffer whatever the world hurls at me for her. I breathed, mantra doing its best to bring my heart rate down. Eager to see her happy and healthy once more. Rounding off the bend and coming up to my driveway, I catch sight of something slithering away from my view. Scaly limbs pushing a sleek body quickly out of sight. I clenched my fist tight to stop my hands shaking and moved with purpose. The moment I crossed that threshold, I would not let my fear cripple me. Brave faces, everyone. I tried not to register the dull hum permeating through the house, the soft chanting with sinister lyrics, the way the lights flickered as I turned a corner to reveal a pale creature standing still, waiting. I smiled at my dad and shook his hand as he said she'd been a treat to supervise. I didn't tell him that something was latched to his neck, worming its way through his ears and nibbling on his temple, repeating his deeds ad nauseum. I couldn't bear to tell him what it was saying but I was thankful to know his mistakes as a young man from his own lips. Honesty kept our family alive, and it helped me save face in front of him as this parasite barked him out. Not that Dab would understand what was going on if I tried. He was a divorcee, and I was his only son. Grief was not something his adult life had experienced much. Heartbreak, depression, sure, but not grief. I saw him out and hastily put the concoction into Amelia's meal as I doom-scrolled on my phone. An ugly habit, but one that helped pass the time. A video memory popped up of us. One of those little reminders Facebook loves to put in front of us that time is slowly slipping away moment by moment. We're getting older, and there is nothing we can do to stop its ceaseless march. I bet that sounded clever in my head, but out loud it just sounds cynical and meat-spirited. Which, given the circumstances, is pretty permissible. Because as I look at the video of a younger me and Amelia... Laughing and hosting a Twin Peaks watch party, I spy a pair of faces that I'd not seen in nearly a decade. Our best friends, Mariana and Caitlin, arm in arm and full of life, full of joy and love. They died on the way home from this party. Drunk driver hit them with the full force of his pickup. He lived, regrettably. 
A thought struck me like a bolt and stuck with me as I finished the mix, taking it to Amelia's room and resting in the armchair by our bedside so she could relax. It was something that aged me and set about pushing my resolve to its absolute limits as the nature of mortality hit me like a renewed wave. How many dead friends do I have on my social media? The fifth month. Clear skies and a soft breeze. Flowers begin to bloom and nature decides to crawl out from the underbrush to proliferate. Everything grows, feeds, exists. Everything is in its place. And Amelia is better once more. She doesn't ask me how it's possible when she feels well enough mentally and physically to make her own lunch. She doesn't question it when she's able to go out for a long walk to the animal shelter to give the lonely dog some love. She just takes the moment with both hands and holds it close to her chest. In the small, quiet moments where the foul whispers can reach me and things aren't protruding from every single crack or crevice to mock me, I could just enjoy her happiness. I take her on road trips to our favorite destinations. We do midnight movie drives so she can watch the Godzilla movies in anticipation of the final showdown she's almost certainly not going to see. But we don't focus on that. We just focus on what we have now. We talk more. A lot more. I tell her about my fears of what happens when she's gone. She listens and absorbs them, waiting until I've spilled out every ugly feeling in me and felt lighter for it. Then, one night near the end of the month while laying in bed, desperately trying not to focus on the tree-like fists smashing against the window to get my attention, I ask her a question. What would you do if you could just stay here forever? Like this? She stares, and her eyes seem to twinkle in the light. How important is this to you, Jasper? I didn't miss a beat in replying. It's everything. You, me, this time where you're not sick. But I am sick, Jasper. Not just sick, I'm dying. She responded calmly, collected. She was at peace. I know, I know. But what if we could find a way to make you better... She got up, a faint smile masking months of pain and turmoil. Honey, I know this has been hard on you. Not knowing which version of me you'll get on any given day. Seeing me at my worst. But this is part of the journey. It's what I expected. You need to expect it too. I tried to bite my lip. This was all for her. The suffering was all for her. In hindsight, this was a stupid thing to say, but I was tired. I was immature. The trees outside craned their necks through the window to observe, sap dripping from their makeshift jaws. You'd want to leave me on my own? You wouldn't even try to change things if you could? What about alternative medicine? Cutting age technology? What if you could make a deal that would give you more time? How could you just think of yourself? Immediate regret. The moment that question left me and shot its way to her ears, I knew I'd fucked up. I was expecting maybe even hoping for a bust-up. A way for us to excise all that pain and anger. A tumultuous argument that was filled with expletives, bitter words, and regretful criticisms. But no. Amelia was beyond that. She turned to look at me with tears in her eyes and her shoulders shaking. I could see the strange insects crawling all over the tree bark, rotting it with their spit and looking for ways to get inside the house. What you want is not as important as how we process this. You are not the one dying, Jasper. You are not the one waking up and not knowing if you'll be able to go to the bathroom on your own. If you'll know what the word food means, if you'll... She took a deep breath, shame filling me with every moment. If you'll even remember who you are. It's selfish to leave you alone? You don't think I know that? You don't think I feel immeasurable guilt when I'm permitted to be lucid by this stupid fucking disease? 
She kicked over our trash can and screamed, piercing and filled with more pent-up frustration and anguish than I could ever have mustered. I want to spend every moment of freedom I have left in joy. Without fear of what it does for you after I'm gone until we reach the end. My exit ticket has been punched, Jasper. I know when I'll be gone. It's up to you to figure out that lack long after. She sank against the wall, pulling at her hair and red-faced. I just want us to be happy. I want to go out of this world with... with... She sank down, eyes glazing over as I tried to find words of comfort, the light in the room dimming a tad. I already know why. I don't pay attention to the creatures skittering across the walls, sucking out the light and the remaining positive energy from the room, determined to gain a foothold. I can hear them hiss in my ears, encouraging me to push Amelia further. I won't let you go. I will fight to the bitter end because that's what a life partner does, I replied solemnly, crouching down in front of her. I'm just... I'm not ready to throw in the towel, Amelia. I see a life ahead of us that has not yet been traveled. I'm determined to find a pathway there, and who knows? Maybe I've found one. I gently put my hand on the side of her head, brushing tears aside to comfort her. But confused and frantic eyes look up at me, eyes filled with fear and the instinct to fight or flight. In this moment, I'd let my guard down and forgotten exactly what she'd been saying this entire time as the bugs shriek a chorus of their warning calls. Amelia was sick. She was fearful of which version would come up when she awoke every day. I'd gotten too comfortable, too caught up in my fantasy of her being fine, not giving her more of the concoction. And it was the end of the month. She said nothing, just growled. Her teeth gritted, and she headbutted me with full force. She pushed me to the ground and followed up with a swift kick to send me into unconsciousness. The sixth month. Darkness, heavy winds, and a bitter chill. The bugs have settled in the house, burrowing into the dry while I'm making their nests. Soon their larvae will hatch and will find warm flesh to feast on, lay their eggs, and spurn the victim to climb to a high point and release their spores. I hope they go for me first. My first memory following untold time and total absence is finishing the dream of a sky burial. Not for Amelia, but myself. I feel the weight of my body on the shoulders of those I love as they slowly, methodically, and carefully take my still warm corpse up a steep mountain. I somehow feel the lick of the cold air and the refreshing sensation of it filling my lungs as we ascend. They lay me down on the peak in a small bed of hay, the sun reaching its zenith and a soft chanting fills the small clearing with passions long since dissipated from my consciousness. Vultures come down and tear at my flesh swallowing me like carrion, taking me into the sky, away from my problems. Something resembling my eye looks down and sees Amelia, safe and healthy. Arms wrapped around a child that looks like... I awaken with a force on my chest, burning on my skin and a splitting headache. The sky outside a clear blue, a momentary respite before my memory kicked in. My nose feels broken, and I can feel a huge bruise forming my cheek where she kicked me. She may be small and sickly, but that woman had energy. The house was an absolute mess. Papers had been torn out of books and strewn across the floor. The lights were almost all absent save for a kitchen light. Spilled food and drinks helped form a trail of carnage as I stumbled around the house, looking for Amelia and hoping she was alright. The bugs had changed their shriek to a low vibration of their wings that formed two consonants easily discernible to my now overly aware ears. Nurgle. Did this mean? A single note had been placed on the countertop. Clean, save for the small glasses of blue liquid, filled halfway and positioned in a circle around the note in the center, a small passage from a history book next to it. The passage detailed a bridge from mythology that, once you crossed it, you could never return. 
It was a one-way passage for all souls, either dead, dying, or seeking respite to the next world. Guarded by an underworld king who coveted his dominion like no other, known to send out emissaries to claim the souls who resisted were those who sought to disrupt the order. Affixed to the bottom of the passage was a small pin on the Sturgeon map showing one of our large bridges between the Metropolitan Area and Mantis Reach, the Golgotha Passage. The note had six words that scared me more than anything my unfiltered eyes could sense, than any consequences for my actions. It sent me rushing to the car and in a blind panic of where to go first, to Dee Dee for advice, or to Golgotha Passage for absolution. Scribed at the top in Amelia's familiar, beautiful cursive, were the words, I'm sorry, I know. And in scratchy, jagged writing beneath were two more that chilled me to my core. It's time. Without birth and death, and without the perpetual transmutation of all the forms of life, the world would be static, rhythmless, undancing, mummified. Alan Watts I won't mince words. I fucked up. The realization sank in that not only had Amelia figured out what I was doing, namely extending her life and giving her more time, but she was going to rectify it in her own way by letting Nurgle, a king of the underworld, take her across Golgothan Bridge and claim her soul for good. I can't let that happen. Racing to Dee Dee's workshop, I found it somehow easier to block out every terrifying thing that attempted to jump out at me or distract me. Sure, my palms were shaking, toes curled inwards to the point of straining them, and my throat was scratchy and swollen, but I was more scared of losing her than anything else. I didn't wait to get an answer. I barged through the door and came face to face with the creature Didi had been operating on prior. Black beady eyes bulged and a sea of slobber caked my shirt as it leapt up, trying to bite at any appendage it could find. <sniffs> Jesus! I cried, stumbling back and the creature clamping its jaws down on my forearm, a pair of sharp incisors crushing the bone and something hot and acidic working its way through my veins. As I looked to find a place to punch it and pull my arm free, I saw a small white in its eyes begin to grow larger, not dissimilar to how a cat's eye widens when it's about to kill its prey. Without thinking, I used what adrenaline I had to lift myself up, creature still attached and tearing at the skin, and throw my body weight into one swing that collided Meridu with the door frame. The searing pain was drowned out by my own screams and that of the creatures as it let go and made guttural groans as it tried to rebound. At that moment, Didi reappeared, jolly as ever as he scooped up Meridu with total ease and, with it still thrashing in his arms, gave it the lightest tap on the skull with an ungloved hand, and it let it fall limp. Ah, oh, <laughs> I see you got acquainted with Meridu. Don't worry, he's mostly harmless, most of the time. Rehabilitation has been difficult because of the baking content. I didn't let him finish. With everything I have, I swing a fist into the side of his plague doctor mask and shatter one of the circular frames in the process. I feel bone crunch onto my knuckles and his body falls with my fist. But he doesn't go to the floor. I am not here for one of your fucking whimsical games, Dee Dee. They took Amelia. She figured out what I was doing and now... Now she's... She's gonna be... I stared down at my shoes, vision blurring and my bitten arm growing weak, but the anger inside me only rising with every moment of my own mounting failure. It's all your fault! I swing again, but this time he effortlessly sidesteps me and grabs my shoulder, pinching the joint ever so slightly, but in such a way that I cannot move or even feel anything. The door closes, and he turns to walk behind me. You get the first one for free, Jasper. Your hurt and Meridu's damage to you is indeed my fault. I thought I could leave him unsupervised, but even he can sense when something is a target, when something sees him for what he is. 
He's an animal from the other side of Sturgeon, you see. They don't like it when people see them for what they are. I see his ungloved, emaciated hand take my damaged arm, but I don't feel it. But the rest? The reason? You can see him? The reason Amelia has gone? That is all on you. He twists it and digs his hand into the wound, pushing up against the joints and the muscles. For a moment, I see only white and a ringing sound floods my ears, teeth clenching. But as soon as it comes, it goes. My arm aches, but I feel mobile once again. Dee Dee is leaning over his desk, book open and looking wary. I can see an eye poke through the shattered frame. It's young, but there's something old within the pupils. <sighs> I'm sorry. You're... <sighs> You're right. I'm mad at myself, my own selfishness. I can't stand the idea that she's going to be gone. I wanted this to go on for a bit longer, and I just... Shame washes over me, and I walk over to take my seat for Lauren. Please, please help me get her back. Help me extend it for just a little longer. He surveys me for a while, breathing heavily. You know that all things must come to an end eventually, right? This was never a permanent solution. He flips the pages to a list of clientele, and both mine and Amelia's names appear next to a list of complex ciphers that jump about on the page as if living, breathing, sentient creatures. She hasn't got long left. But if you are to extend it, it's going to cost you dearly, Jasper. I know. I'll lose my sanity if I stay any longer with this ability to see the unseen, but I'm prepared to do it. Especially if it means I get her back. If I get more time with her. She's worth everything to me. I was resolute, steadfast that I could handle more nightmares and threats. Dee Dee shook his head, and for the first time, I sensed pity. No, Jasper. This is the final extension. Should we get her back, it will cost you your soul. A life for a life. I will let her carry on, but at the expense of your own well-being. This is the offer I extend to you. He didn't break his gaze. He'd done this before. I'm sorry. Take some time to think it over. I looked to the window and simply observed for a moment. I watched nature take place in the clearing, the sun hanging at its zenith as all manner of creatures proliferate beneath its majesty. Harvester ants take pieces of a decaying stick insect to bring back to their nest and feed their ravenous queen. Many of her brood infected with the parasitic wasp larvae that will eat its way out of her young before going off to repeat the cycle. Birds of all shapes and sizes flock to the many trees in Sturgeon City Park. I watch for a while as they congregate, the males flashing their vibrant plumage and the females twitching their heads, deciding if this is her life partner. I look out to the McGraw Memorial Park, children playing happily, parents gossiping about their day-to-day -day issues, and the elderly sitting by, watching the next generation flourish under the trees they planted. Life goes on. It will continue to go on even after everyone on this earth is gone and a brand new generation, new and vibrant with no connections to the old guard, inherit the land. This world will keep on turning and spinning on its axis. Life will find ways to proceed. And, above all else, it'll step aside when the time comes, I breathed, a tear running down my face. Didi looked at me. Even beneath the mask, it wasn't tough to see his studious gaze. He looked as if he were trying to figure out a puzzle. With a swift turn on his heel, he clapped his hands together and grabbed the heavy book, sliding it under his arm. All right, it's settled. Looks like you've made your choice. As a gesture, I will act as blinders for your fears until we reach the Golgothan Bridge. Can't have you being scared of every damn thing on the way and wasting time, can we? He patted me on the shoulder, that weight far beyond what it should be. Walking to his shelves, he hummed and grabbed some bottles, stuffing them into his coat before dashing out the door and straight for my car. It's funny what you notice as you're frantically trying to get somewhere. How much your legs shake, your knuckles whiten as you grip the steering wheel, 
the irritability rising to unparalleled levels, not because of other circumstances, but because you know you're late to something that you should have always been early to. But we can never plan for the unexpected. That is the nature of grief. I must have been breathing heavily, the sounds of my teeth grinding as I sped up, turning down a long dirt road connecting Sturgeon's eastern markets to the Golgothan Bridge, a little trail known as the Myopic Road. Dee Dee sighed and tapped the car's computer dashboard, scrolling through the playlist Amelia had left. Forever Honeymoon. Do you mind if I... His hand hovered over the song selection, waiting for my approval. Shoulders hunched, and I nodded. It... It did us no good to sit in suffocating silence as the road dipped and the trees began encircling the trail. Thick black roots jutting out and retaking what humanity had carved out on the main road. He had play. And I immediately knew what song he'd chosen and why. How did you... I breathed. But he shook his head and held up a finger, pointing to the road ahead. In the darkness, something curled up on the ground, swaddled in a thick custom blanket and shivered. And the closer I got, the easier the features were to make out. The space buns, bright hair, petite frame. Amelia! I slammed the brakes, headlights still beaming on her body some thirty feet away, frantically unbuckling my seatbelt to dart over and save her. But Didi grabbed onto my arm and I froze. His voice was low, purposeful, without malice, but absolutely dripping in determination. I resisted for a moment, until I saw the figure cloaked in flames emerge from the thicket each step bringing with it small circlets of flames that burst forth and extinguished. The flesh was melting away, dropping to the ground in large chunks with a wet slop sound, but the face still bore recognition to its original form. It was mine. Terror gripped my stomach as his malformed version of me loomed over Amelia, not a single ember touching her flame as it outstretched its arms and protected her, shrieking at the top of its lungs. She will not die. I will protect her. I will save her. At his cry, winged creatures descended from the tree branches. Fat, oversized ravens with sharpened claws and spiked beaks as they scratched and clawed at his body. Desperate to reach her, with every defiant swat away, more of his skin fell and his scream grew hoarse, falling to his knees and laying over Amelia, the beasts encircling him. No, I won't accept it. I felt the sweat run down my brow as the birds took pieces of him away before flying up and back into the trees. Nothing left in their place but a stack of ashes. What did I just... I felt my hands shaking. Your denial. Keep driving. Dee Dee's words hung in the air as I put my foot down the accelerator gently and the car rolled down the hill, over the ash, and descended into further darkness. It was a couple of minutes before I spotted it. A hulking mass of arms pulling apart birds and smashing them against the trees. Its guttural scream shook the windows of the car and sipped the hairs on my arm and edge. I could feel its rage from this distance and felt unseen eyes fixate upon me. Nobody will take her away from me! It shrieked, pulling apart one hapless bird, desperately trying to beat its wings and escape. The beak firmly gripped in one pulsating fist as another arm ripped it away. Black blood spilling over the creature. Small slits with teeth opening up on the biceps to lap out the contents. Then, just like the first, it began bubbling into a pool of the collective black blood. Barely visible toothpick legs dropping in and dissolving at the mere touch. Still... Regardless of the pain, it refused to stop thrashing, even as the last biceps tried desperately to smash the remaining birds. No! Body! It gurgled. The form disappearing underneath the liquid pit with a final sizzle, and the remaining birds flying back into the woods. I wasn't... I'm not that angry. I protested, feeling disgust at what I witnessed in a hardened core of dread in my gut. But you were once. Come on. Dee Dee extended a finger towards the still descending pit, gradually becoming steeper before the blackness swallowed the rest. I obeyed, 
letting the car gently descend with my foot still easing off the brake pedal. My free leg bouncing and the mounting anxiety of time wasted was not lost on me. I knew we couldn't do this forever. Look, Amelia's running out of time. Can we do this some other time? I get that I need to do better. I need to recognize my problems with her illness, but there has to be a quicker way to do this. I was practically pleading, taking my eyes off the road to look at him and show him how much I meant it. Didi, you have to understand. No, Jasper. It's you who needs to understand. We're not here to address just one problem. We're here because it's a part of the journey. There is no reaching Amelia without going through this place. If you don't understand yet, well, you're about to. I didn't understand what he meant, but seeing him brace the sides of his car seat was indication enough. I turned back in time to see someone flagging down the car, arms flailing wildly in the air and a wide, crazed look in their eyes. They walked around to my window and frantically started screaming at me. Oh, thank God you came. Look, I don't have time to explain, but I need you to let me in. I've got to get out of this place. There's something super important I have to do, so... He immediately tried the door handle without waiting for a response. Eyes darting down, just looked back up at me, confused. Come on, man. Let me in. I turned to Didi, already feeling my stomach turn to knots. He shook his head and I mimicked it back. I can't. I, I, I have somewhere to be too, and we can't deviate. I'm so sorry. Before I could finish, he slammed his head into the window with full force, the sickening sound of bone meeting glass as his blood freely poured down the bridge of his nose, features twisted as he snarled against the glass. You're sorry? Dude, I cannot be late. I'll give you anything, please. Please. He reared his head back and smashed again, saying please, please. with every repeated sickening please. strike. As he did, I saw his features shift and change until they softened in place. Please. The flat nose became uplifted. The eyes changed color and the lips grew full of blood staining the teeth. Amelia. Please, we can forget this. Please. I reached for the handle, but Didi grabbed me, staring at her. Bargaining. It's another test. You need to drive, Jasper. How the window hadn't shattered yet was beyond me. The sickening crunching is intermixing with the splattering of blood caking the glass. I couldn't fathom the hesitation. We can bring her with us. She's obviously got lost while finding her way back here. She needs our help. Dee Dee just stared at me, incredulous. What was he even saying? I watched this person shift before my very eyes. I was bargaining. I blinked. Clarity overcoming me as I put the car into drive and speeding off, clipping them ever so slightly as I did. We drove for another few minutes as the road evened out. The sky above almost totally blotted out by the towering trees. We descended for some time and it seemed we'd hit the bottom. There was a small patch of gravel to the side for us to park up, Dee Dee indicating to pull over. We sat in silence for a few minutes as the music played out and the realization of what it was witnessing came to focus. Depression's next, right? Indeed. Are you ready? Didi seemed concerned, but detached, like he knew this was something I had to face. I swallowed, feeling sandpaper in my throat. I don't think that matters right now, Didi. But if I need to face it to get out of here, to get to Nurgle and Amelia, and that's what I'll do. It's never been about facing these trials, Jasper. It's about what comes after. What you are willing to accept. He pointed towards the center of the road. You must face what's coming, not what is already here. I didn't understand what he meant, but it was clear that there was no progress without doing as he instructed. I almost found myself missing the lackadaisical and whimsical persona he had before. But this was hardly a time for comedic undertones. I did as instructed, and walked with purpose to the center of this endless stretch of road, every foot forward evoking a fresh sense of guilt, anxiety, and depression. Left foot forward. You know that all of this is finite. It has an end point. Right foot forward. Eventually, we must all say goodbye. 
It is a natural part of the cycle of life. Left foot forward. She will die. That is a certainty. And one day... Right foot forward. I looked at the expanse in front of me and felt a cold wind whip at my face, stinging my face and hardening the tears. I'll be alone. Completely, utterly alone. I know. And I'm not ready. I breathed, feeling this cold breeze smash against my bare skin and envelop my flesh, the same black substance that had dissolved the anger beast wrapping itself around every fiber of my being, crawling its way up my waist and digging into my stomach. The further it climbed, the more my misery grew, the more that fear deep inside me grew. Every anxiety-riddled thought and depressive cycle forced its way past the rational barrier of my brain and screamed louder than anything else I could muster. One moment you have all these enjoyments, all these little rituals that make you happy, and then one day, poof, they're gone. You're gone. The formless voice hisses as it slithers around my chest. You will cease to exist. The world will keep spinning. Those who love you will grieve for a time, but then they too will die. Eventually, all who know your name, your idiosyncrasies, your nuances, they will be gone, and you will be less than an echo. This is the fate that awaits us all. The fate that awaits Amelia. I sank to my knees, pain racked sobs as I was unable to control ripped through me and I cast my head up to the sky as this thing took more of my body, my legs already growing numb from the cold. Is there no, no way to save her? To give her the life she deserves and the closure of knowing she'll be at peace? <laughs> I mumbled between cries. I just want her to be safe. I want her to be healthy with or without me. Dee Dee got out and leaned against the car, windows drawn down and the music playing, even as this mass overtook my body. Nurgle's going to take her away, isn't he? I croaked, flashes of memories running through my mind, small moments of her beauty, her serenity, idiosyncrasies you learned to tune out that had long lost their novelty now coming to the surface anew. Yes, Jasper. There's nothing to be done about it, and fighting him will yield you nothing. You are no warrior or arbiter of fate. You are a man going through unmitigated heartbreak. Dee Dee leaned forward and reached out a hand. But you can get past it. You need only accept what is going to come to pass. I felt the shape slither up my neck, pulling at my windpipe, and the weight of my grief growing ever heavier on my shoulders. I will never get another sunny day with her. Another night binging our favorite show or making inside jokes about things we've done. I'll never have a family with her. I felt the tears run down my face and my cheeks grow hot, my voice beginning to fail me. No, you won't. But that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the time you still have left. Love is about sacrifice and trust. Whether you take my offer of a life for a life or not, someone must depart today. That doesn't eliminate the love you have. Not one bit. I grabbed his hand and pulled with everything I had, the black mass pulling at my skin and splitting it in places as it desperately tried to cling to me, scratching up my wrists and stomach as it was steadily peeled away. I fell to the floor, my body stinging and a feeling of calm beginning to wash over me. I understand. By journey's end, someone has to go. There is no bargaining with the king of the dead. I took in a deep breath and surveyed the road ahead, now beginning to curve upwards and out of the forest. I nodded to Dee Dee and we both got in the car, nursed my wounds, and buckled in, selecting the playlist and queuing up a track. Wedding songs. Whatever it takes, Amelia. We came out of the clearing within 15 minutes, 
a somber silence permeating the car, knowing what had to come next. It was so similar to that first time we went to the hospital, knowing full well the news we'd receive when we getting there. A moment of both dread and clarity mixed into one. Before long, the Grand Golgothan Bridge, formerly known as the Golgothan Pass, came into view, connecting Central Sturgeon and the Wharf to the nearby Mantis Bay. Nobody really recalls when it was built, but scholars say it's been there when the people first began settling in what would have been later known as Sturgeon some 850 years ago. Large obsidian pillars and thick rusted chains connecting the wooden boards. Eventually, they'd be swapped out for tarmac and safety nets would be placed on either side to prevent wayward drivers going over or anything in the rivers from coming up. Legends always persisted that the bridge had an otherworldly aspect to it that it was the bridge to the underworld when approached in the right circumstances. In the waning hours between dusk and dawn, a soul stuck between the realms could make the pilgrimage and offer themselves willingly to the underworld king and queen, making the transition easier, depending on their quality of character. As we drove down the wharf, the hour growing late and a thick fog rolling in, I began feeling one overwhelming emotion. Clarity. Didi, I have a question. If it's about my baking secrets, I'm afraid I'm sworn to the grave to keep them. <laughs> he replied, chuckling. Ask away, Jasper. What do you think dying is like? He considered my question. The slow crawl of the car against the setting sun and lavender sky a perfect backdrop. Hmm. I think... In all my years of watching the wicked, weird, and wonderful pass through the gates of life and death, the death is as mundane as it is terrifying, as beautiful as it is visceral. Death is a chorus of your friends and family welcoming you home after a long sabbatical away, eager to share tales of their exploits into big or own. Death is the most beautiful of reunions and the best surprise party. Because nobody ever expects to have the lights shut on this world, only for them to be flicked back on so unceremoniously. He pauses, his voice quivering. Death is the safest place you ever had in life, magnified with all the love you kept along for the ride. It's a journey all undertake, but none can report. He points a finger to the sky as we round a corner and park up at the base of a bridge some stars beginning to poke through the thin veneer of lavender and bring with them a beautiful cobalt blue, swirling colors of untold beauty twinkling gently against the skyline. That is death. It is beauty reaching back aeons to let us know it was alive. It burned brightly and fiercely. It went out as it came in. With purpose. I smiled as we got out, handing him the keys and instructing him on what to do when he heard the cue. Thank you, Dee Dee. For everything. He held out a hand and shook mine, a firm grip, and pulled me in for a tight hug. Always. No matter what you do, it is done in the name of love. Tell her the truth, Jasper. She will understand. I strolled through the fog and did my best to ignore the whispers on the wind, calling, screaming, and laughing in their mocking tones to scare me. I won't lie to you and say I feared nothing. I feared everything. But the notion of putting things right was strong enough to carry me through anything. I'm here, Nurgle. I want to make this right. I... I know I fucked up. Please, let's talk about this. A low, authoritative voice boomed out from all directions, sounding close enough to touch, and yet so far above me. Sturgeonites. Always thinking they can find a workaround to the natural order of things. Well, not this time. You wish to talk? Why should I converse with a whelp who fights against my very order with such vitriol? He spat. I guess it's the venom in his words, even from here. Because I want to make a deal. To appease you and make this right by Amelia. Please. I held my hands up and dropped to my knees. I'll do what needs to be done. 
He made a grunting sound before the air grew hot and a wind whipped up some distance away. A well-dressed man with a shimmering bald head and black antlers stood there. He fiddled with his red tie and the blue suit glistened in the waning light. The air felt strange around him. He exuded such intense authority that I almost didn't dare rise to my feet until he extended a hand encouraging me to do so. Speak. What do you propose? He eyed me up and down, as if considering my value. All the creatures I'd seen didn't compare to the sheer presence of this man. I tried to extend Amelia's life because I was, am, so terrified of losing her. I ignored her wishes and tried to get her proper medical help, but she was resigned to her fate. I did the most egregious thing and kept her alive for my own selfish reasons, suffering to keep her happy. At first, I thought it was just an extra month, a gift from me to her. But seeing her that vibrant, full of life again, I just fell into denial and refused to let go. I felt the sobs rising in my throat, but I bit down and carried on, refusing to lose my nerve. Not now. Dee Dee has made a proposition. Her life for mine. She suffered because of my mistake, and I've come to terms with the end. I just think she's deserving of another chance. To find someone who will love her better. He stares at me, black eyes shining and hands behind his back as he calls behind him. Did you hear all that, miss? A familiar voice cuts through the fog, and from the car, I can hear Dee Dee turning up the car stereo. I did. It was very sweet and decidedly on brand for him. A shape comes through the fog, and I recognize the contours, the hair, the gleeful grin. Amelia! And what would you like to do? Do you wish to take his offer? She steps to Nurgle's side and pulls a mock, thinking face before crossing the distance, replacing her hands in mine. It's very like Jasper to try and do things his own way even at the expense of himself. But it's not his burden to bear. She caresses the side of my cheek, wiping away a tear. Jasper, you can't atone for a mistake in death. And leaving me here alone isn't going to fix that. This happened to me, and it is with me it shall stay. Amelia, I'm so sorry. I was just so terrified of losing you. I thought maybe if I took the plunge, whatever was after would make the wait easier. I... I... <laughs> I broke down as she began softly weeping too, the smile never leaving her face like she knew something I didn't. I know, honey. But part of this is knowing to let go. It's not meant to be easy. Something you can just figure out over a single revelation. You will go through many peaks and valleys of hurt. You will spend months feeling fine and feeling guilty as a result. You'll beat yourself up for never crying when you should. And then, suddenly, you'll be in a store buying jerky and it'll hit you like a tidal wave. Because you'll want to tell me something and I won't be there. And that's going to be the hardest part. I didn't know what to say. What else could I say? I pulled her in for the tightest hug I'd ever given her. A hug that felt like it would kill me to break away from, as she nestled her face into my chest. Can we have a moment... to... say goodbye? I looked at Nurgle, checking a pocket watch in his waistcoat. He sighed and nodded, turning on his heel and waving his hand as he disappeared into the fog. Remember this and be grateful, Jasper, he called. We stayed there for a moment before I realized that I'd asked Dee Dee to do. Taking a moment to wish the circumstances were different, I leaned my head back. Hey Dee Dee, turn it up. Anita leaned her head up, those beautiful eyes peering into mine and the enormity of our lost future deep within them. Tears welling up as she heard the familiar chords. Our first dance. I put my hand on her hip and we softly moved as the song echoed along the bridge prophetic lyrics once again ringing out. You know, we would have made an amazing old couple. I whispered into her ear. She giggled. I know. 
a couple in their 70s maintaining the stereotype of crazy old folks who scream to get off their property, preferably with a makeshift hunting rifle. She sniffed. You'd be undertaking wacky hobbies, and I bet I'd still be boxing, skydiving long into my 80s. I spun her around and watched her body move with the motions, so graceful and like moving art. As she pulled back in, I kissed her. Hands at her face and with every bit of passion we'd had the first time we met as teens. The day she said yes. And when I walked her down the aisle. Dee Dee says he thinks death is like the best surprise party ever. All your friends waiting eagerly to catch up with you after your long journey back home. I paused, hands shaking. Wonder how many stories I'll have to tell you when I get there. I'll be ready with a cup of tea and good arms. Maybe I'll have some of my own. Who knows what else is waiting for me there? It's a whole new adventure when you think about it. I paused, considering the weight of my words. You'd have been an amazing mom. The absolute best. I'd have done anything for you. And you'll find a chance to do that again. One day. She croaked, teary-eyed as we danced at a beat. You kidding? You're my one and only. I'll be the greatest hermit you've ever seen. I tried to force a smile, but she shook her head. No, you have to promise me you'll find someone one day. When you're ready, you have so much love to give, Jasper. And if you don't, I'm going to haunt you forever and make everything annoying. Spoons will go missing, your wallet will be put on the top shelf, you name it. We laughed and came together once more, content in that moment as one's soul. Laughter turned to tears, and we sobbed. Would that be so bad? I asked in a small voice. She shook her head and put her finger on my lips, a soft, please, from her, before I nodded. I promise, I'm really It's almost time, honey. I'm so glad we got this time. I was worried there'd always be something left unsaid. I looked at her, the same way I'd done for so many years. The older she'd gotten, the more beautiful she'd become. All I could do was smile at how lucky I'd been. There's nothing left to say. I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. Horrors and all. I kissed her forehead, savoring the moment as her hands wrapped over mine. I'm so glad I chose you. I stopped searching so I go. When I got to have the adventure we did, I'll be waiting for you on the next one. So don't be late, okay? There's a nerf war waiting. I love you. Jasper. With that, we slowly danced as the song reached its crescendo and exchanged one final kiss. I felt her hand slip through mine, and within a few moments, she was gone. A great whooshing sound filled my ears, and the sound of great doors shutting cut through the night. I finished the dance and stood there the fog beginning to clear as the other side of the bridge became visible. I felt my heart shatter all over again as I stared into space, still hoping she would come back. You know you could never have taken my deal, Jasper. Amelia and Nurgle knew that, of course. I turned to see Dee, Dee walking up towards me, unclasping his plague mask. Why not? I thought it was a serious offer. He got closer and removed the mask, letting it drop to the ground and looking at me. A beautiful mix of white face paint. The eyes enshrouded in black shadows, gorgeous bright patterns starting at the forehead, running across the cheeks and finishing at the base of the skull. It would be unbecoming of a member of death to mess with the order of things, wouldn't it? But a healthy nudge in the right direction? I don't think anyone would mind. He smiled, diamonds in his teeth. A wave of comfort shot over me. D.D. Death of disease. We all have our part to play. 
my sister Lady Death covers our warriors, but my job involves looking after a different kind of fighter. He puts a reassuring arm on my shoulder. That's why you helped. Why you guided me through it. Dee Dee, I don't know what to say. My eyes widened as I realized what was happening. Who I was talking to. Amelia, is she... Amelia is safe. I promise. I can't tell you what happens next. But I know she's waiting for you. Wherever it is. Come on, it's a long drive. And I have some baking secrets to share with you. With that, we set off for the car and away from the Golgothan Bridge. Away from Amelia and into the unknown. A new month. It is a beautiful day. The air is cool and there is life all around us. I look up at the night sky and see even more stars littering the canvas. But there is one in particular that stands out. It shines right over me and radiates with its twinkling beauty, far surpassing that of its siblings. It is fierce, bright, <laughs> and pink. There's not much to say after a tale like that. So instead, I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes on the subject of life and death by George Santanaya. There is no cure for birth and death save to enjoy the interval. The dark background which death supplies brings out the tender colors of life in all of their purity. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly, and we'd love to have you as part of the Dustlot family by subscribing, hitting the bell of extension. It's just a normal bell, but adding stuff like that is nice. And leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. Dustlot now has a Twitter account, and we're hoping to put unusual lore and use it for community interaction while we continue our journey to get monetized here. Please consider checking us out over at Dustlot Radio, where we may even talk about projects in advance. And if we can get over 500 followers by July's end, We'll be revealing the trailer for our next full-length Sturgeon story, a very long one. Dedication needs to be rewarded, and we thank more and more of our loyal listeners for joining these premieres each and every time. This time, we give thanks to Kyle Volk, Michelle Chadwick, Lady Nevermore, Fatal Charm, Call Me Rev, Mad Vasquez, May Man, the Jalapenos Cashew, Jason and Gamma are terrifying twosome at every premiere, and our moderator Penny Tails Up for giving us that valuable time. Want to get a shout-out? Be sure to join our premieres or leave a comment below and I'll do my darndest to find the ones that stand out. I hope we can continue this forward growth and spread our spores to the far corners of YouTube, infecting the airways with our intoxicating presence. We're already so close to 500, let's see how long it takes for us to hit a thousand. This is your gift for joining us so far. And one last time, listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them. Dusklide will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a video about emperor penguins, eat something spicy, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow with the window open and the stars twinkling down on you. Start and end each day with kindness in your heart. A reminder to be better today than you were yesterday. You matter, you are loved, and every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station. Most heartfelt greetings and salutations, ladies and gentle dims. I eagerly welcome you to Sturgeon's most premier station, Dusk Light Radio. Hosted by yours truly, the fortune-finding, feverishly feral, and ferociously forlorn Everett J. Blackwell. 
Perhaps you know of us Blackwells. Oh, we operated Sturgeon's first true escape room. It was padded from end to end with a complicated mechanism at the back. No drawers or other hideaway areas to explore. Participants had to ingest something through a small flap in the door three times a day and answer cognitive questions regularly in order to gradually unlock the door and finally leave. Old Salem Blackwell called it the Rehabilitation Escape Room, and eventually it caught on nationwide. Hmm. I'm just now realizing that they may have pioneered the first sanitarium, and I simply imagined it was an escape room. Perhaps I've paid a visit over the years. But let's move on. Anyway, I'm Dusklight's main and most fabulous half-dead host. My job at this fine radio station is to bring you some of the most twisted, interesting, and downright bizarre tales that I and my wonderful many-legged runners collect from the far corners of Sturgeon and beyond. Some of them will make you laugh, some will make you cry, and some... Some of you will want to show your appreciation by becoming a member or go into our currently non-existent Patreon. And while we appreciate both gestures, truly we do, listeners. You have a more pragmatic form of gratitude at your disposal right now. I bet you didn't even know. Simply face away from the closest corner of your room, bend yourself backwards until you can view it upside down, and draw on your lips with purple crayon until you summon the... <sighs> ah. No, no, don't, don't do that, listeners. I, I apologize, dear listeners. TJ snuck in some notes about how to summon the purple crayon god. Aubergine the Unhearing. Uh, just ignore that. Simply leave a comment and have notifications turned on. That'll be plenty. But perhaps we will offer a membership or Patreon for early listeners to the scene's mishaps. Let me know what you think in the comments below. It's time for our next story of this evening. It, uh... Oh my. Listeners, this is a transcript provided by Janitor Supremo TJ Lee taken from the desk of our Sturgeon Sheriff himself, Sheriff Erickson. He heard we broadcasted tales from Sturgeon and beyond, decided he wanted to let his be known to us, to all of you. Now, this is only one part of the sordid tale, and to hear the other side, though not necessary to appreciate this story, you will need to keep an eye on Spirit Voice's channel for it. It's coming soon. This Sturgeon tale... Furniture Doesn't Talk. Featuring voice work by T.J. Lee, all hail his genitorial wisdom, has an addendum attached, scrawled in crayon with multiple drawings of buttered crumpets, mint chalk ice creams, and, uh... Yeah, what, what the hell is this, T.J.? A turbo bear. Uh, okay. T.J. has asked those loyal listeners who somehow haven't done so already to go and please consider checking out our latest show here at Dusklight. Lord knows how we got management to sign off on it. A Sturgeon-focused Monster of the Week campaign, The Nightmare Detectives. All our primers are now available, the first one covering the character background, Sturgeon itself, and what they were doing in the first arc, the second primer covering the interlude leading into our first full recorded arc, and the third one covering the last unlistenable episode. The first full session is live, and our next full episode will be up this Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Stay tuned to our community tab for more information. We are beyond grateful for the over 10,000 listens across entries and the 1,500 subscriber milestone we just reached. Looks like 2,000 is coming sooner than we thought. Special thanks must be given first to Mandy Mo for rendering yours truly in the beauteous image you see when you look at our page. Our music is provided with permission by Cryo Chamber, Invato Elements, and the Dark Somnium with gracious thanks. Your voice for this tale is our jubilant janitor TJ Lee, and if you enjoy these intros and want to see more, please ensure you've got notifications on and leave a comment for every video you encounter. With that, the sun has set and dusk has crawled into the studio once more. Whether you're working, prepping to sleep, or evading the formless void that will one day consume us all, Blackwell is here to soothe your ears and captivate your soul. Now, close your eyes and take a deep breath. The scene has been set and the light is on. It's time to walk towards it. It is as it sounds. Incredulous as it may be, 
and I promise there's an explanation within. I've been the sheriff of a little town called Sturgeon for nearly 23 years. In that time, I've seen many a horrific incident descend upon our town, fall out of my jurisdiction and get passed to the higher-ups faster than you can say nightmare scenario. It's frustrating and there's damn sure plenty of days where I feel that I'm just a prop of the fucking toy badge. But I'm still needed for the wet work, the ugly jobs, and the things that stick with you no matter what your poison of choice may be. There's a saying about gazing into the void and it gazes into you. But what do you do when the void follows you wherever you go? Nobody is making me share this report. This account of the events that unfolded over a castor oil creek deserves the light of day. Even if it haunts me with every waking moment. A negative to my every positive. For example, while 89% of missing persons are found, that includes dead or alive. People go missing, frequently. Put enough folks in one place and you're bound to have bad apples, rotten apples, and things that wear the skin of apples to lure in precocious prey. So when people began vanishing in quick succession in Sturgeon, it was something we took notice of. I'd long suspected that it was one perpetrator, targeting seemingly at random. They left no evidence, no bodies were ever recovered, and it was always a situation where the overwhelming emotion we were left with was helplessness. If I never have to look a grieving family in the eyes and tell them I've done all I can again, it'll be too goddamn soon. But we're a small sheriff's office and our resources are limited. This land is old and full of places we simply cannot search. Eventually, it either is open but privately declared closed, or the higher-ups take interest and we're left fielding apologies left, right, and center. Not this time. No. This time, it started with us and ended with us. I need another drink. I can't face sharing this without a couple in me. Hell, y'all have no clue who I am and you're already wise to the fact that I'm stalling. I apologize. Context matters in this case. Flyers started appearing over town back in winter of 2019. Simple, bespoke tables made by Master Crafter Wayland Mosley looking for an apprentice, a muse, and a varnisher to help him. Sales must be inquired further. When prompted, he'd brag about how his craft was passed down to him from his father and his father's father. Something about old blood, sweat, and tears poured into every creation. In those early days, I asked him if he kept any of his furniture or if he sold on most of his pieces. He bristled at the response before saying something that forever was etched into my mind. Only the ones I connect with. We were already dealing with the situation at the time. It was decided that a two-part sting operation, first would be to entice him with a purchase he couldn't refuse, the next would be to catch him in the act as soon as he got to his workshop. Truth be told, we didn't know what exactly we'd find but we knew something shady was going on. We suspected human trafficking. We were wrong. We were so, so fucking wrong. My hands are still shaking. Another drink should help, right? God, I hope so. Deputy Willis eagerly volunteered for the job. He was young, fast became my best friend. My last deputy went on maternity leave and wasn't planning on coming back, so Willis, being the happy helper, stepped up. 25 years old and wise beyond his years, he was the best little brother I could ask for. The age gap made him feel more like a son. I'd lost mine many years ago to a strange cult. Our parents died young and he was painfully shy so I felt the need to protect him. Still, 
when someone steps to the plate to do that duty and to impress you. Well, it's hard to say no to that. I made him promise me he'd contact us on the transmitter the second he sensed danger. I promised him in return, we'd never let anything happen to him. I have lied many times. I have lied to my wife, to my friends, and to myself. But lying without realizing it at the time is the worst thing imaginable. It is a lie that will haunt me forever. We set up shop at the Sturgeon Flea Market, a place we had very little jurisdiction within. It was decreed long ago that for things to run smoothly and with as little bloodshed as possible, compromises had to be made with the higher-ups. Deals were cut, and we promised to look the other way so long as the trouble wasn't brought to our doorstep. We were up to our chests in filth, and the people were either none the wiser or simply did as we did. I hated it, knowing that as I donned an unassuming outfit and grabbed my beard for the occasion, setting up this small curio stand in the middle of a slew of entrepreneurs who dabbled in the occult, the vile, and the unspeakable, I was no different from them. After all, I was selling Willis. Perhaps he didn't see it that way, but I sure as hell did. Once Waylon paid for him, Willis was his to do with as he wished. He strolled up around noon. He was a lot more well-kempt than I pictured. Maybe two decades of dealing with the ugliest of criminals gave me a biased impression of someone who I thought dabbled in human trafficking, but this guy looked... normal. Standing about 5'8", 155 pounds, nice clothes if a little eccentric. His short red hair was gelled and parted to the side, his freckled smile giving off a disarming sensation. He stopped in his tracks and looked at what I had on offer. A mixture of antiques, curiosities, and Willis sat in a leather chair with his best poker face. He was told to look like he had been broken, and he certainly gave off that impression. The moment he laid eyes on Willis, something clicked in him. He's magnificent, he breathed, running his hands across his legs and thighs, as if inspecting a priceless artifact. I had to hold down bile as I forced a smile, remembering my training. You like him, kid? I walked over, slapping his shoulder with pride. Well... This one was a hell of work to make, but I'm damn proud of how he turned out. I laughed, but my eyes fixated on Waylon, who bristled as I put force on Willis's shoulder. I couldn't figure out why at the time, but he brushed it off and reached for his wallet. How much? I saw his lip quiver ever so slightly. What did he have planned for him? I wanted to tackle this fucker to the ground right there and then but the trained words spilled out of me before I could stop myself. For Willis? Hmm. He's a model after all. How much you got? I put on my best salesman face and leaned in, disgusted at myself for how far I'd go to secure the arrest, telling myself it's for the victim's past, present, and future. He's a keeper, you know. Waylon fumbled and pulled out 60 bucks, saying something about rent and stimulus checks not being in. I was taken aback. If he was a human trafficker, where was his cut? I stared, trying to formulate a response, but he pulled something out of his pocket before I could reply and held it in front of me. As I saw this, it was my grandma's. It's a warding talisman. It's supposed to keep bad spirits away. It's priceless. So this was why we never found him. The fucker was handing me the one thing that was keeping him hidden. I realize to many of you, this is hokum, and I don't blame you. But where I come from, this sort of old practice does what it says on the tin. It keeps the wearer obscured. Not invisible or any kind of shit like that, but it hides them from prying eyes. 
and either he didn't know what it truly did, or he simply didn't care when faced with a new model to take home. Didn't matter. This was what I wanted. There was nothing more to do. I took the talisman and inspected it, nodding as he took Willis by the hand and walked away. Willis took one last look back at me, his eyes glowing with pride. He knew he was going to be the one to call it in and we'd be heroes for capturing one of Sturgeon's worst human traffickers. As I smiled back, a chill ran through the air and practically froze my blood. An omen. I realize to those of you following along, there has been no pause in this account. But for me, I had to stop and drink myself to sleep. The closer we get to the moment it all came to a head, the more I want to put a bullet between my eyes and make it all go away. But I recognize the public interest in what happened, and I have a duty to tell it, hence sharing my story with Dusklide. So we continue. Willis's tracker was supposed to allow us to follow him no matter where he went. Even if Wayland stripped him bare and gave him new clothes. It was under his skin, after all. We didn't expect Wayland to check that. And yet, once their signal went towards the Kartuk woods, it simply died. Sixteen hours had passed, and we were beginning to get antsy. It was decided we would look at the area surrounding the woods and see who lived in the area. It didn't take us long to find Castor Royal Creek, and the small set of lodges out there. While old man Mathers was immediately ruled out, the same couldn't be said for his neighbor across the creek. Been in this area a long, long time, he told us on the drive up there. All of them settled here before my family did. Helped us build this here lodge for a time until my great-great-grandpappy Obadiah asked him to leave. Never told us why. Simply said it weren't right what they were doing over there. And now there's just one. Don't see him much. He's a solitary type. He's so involved in his woodworking, he don't even notice what's going on in this here creek. We pressed him on the creek, but all he'd say was, bad water, and refused to comment further, instead pausing and replying with, looks like a storm's a-brewing. Better be ready. We arrived at the old lodge within 20 minutes quiet night with the moon reflecting over the creek. Not a sound of nature or insects whatsoever as we made our approach. You'd think with three cars and five trained servicemen, we'd be less intimidated. But nothing prepares you for what we saw. Breaking down the door, we were greeted with an almost ancient and rustic living room. Dust littered everything, and the furniture looked so decrepit and worn down that it'd break if so much as anything touched it. The smell of rotting wood and mothballs was overpowering. I'm sure mold was a factor too, but there was something iron-like in the air that I couldn't place. A quick sweep of the home showed us the only non-dusty area, the large rug. Moving that aside led to a trapdoor that, with great effort, came open and led down a large set of stairs. As we descended, the smell of death began to grow in intensity. Our less experienced servicemen opting to hang back and cover the entrance, leaving me and two colleagues to continue. <sighs> Fuck. I need another drink. My hands won't stop shaking. We approached what I can only describe as a leathery, undulating door. It shook in place and felt like the hide of a cow to touch. It was warm when I placed my hand against it and something moved underneath my palm. I pushed without much force and the door gave way. The stench was unbearable and my eyes watered as my stomach threatened to eject everything within it. I felt my knees begin to buckle but my resolve kept them upright. I was grateful all three of us had masks on. I don't know if I'd been able to cope otherwise. The room was stained in red. It had been transformed into a living area with odd furniture lining each section of the sizable room. A large, hairy wardrobe in the corner next to a bed that seemed to sway in place. 
a small chest of drawers with bizarre shelves holding a sparked lamp on top of it. A TV sat in the center of the room, some strange mesh coating its entire frame and a screen blaring out static that partially illuminated the room. The yellow couch with purple spots seeming to dance in the light. To the right, however, sat cages. Some rusted over and others covered in filth and blood, but they were unmistakable. Got you. There, right in the center, clad in a stained apron and humming to himself, was Waylon, busying himself over a table with a slew of tools cast at the side. Waylon Mosley, you're under arrest for human trafficking. I called, trying to push authority into my voice as best I could, trying not to gag. He put a thick top over the table and turned, as if in a daze, arms spread out and smiling. Have you come to check out my furniture, officer? He laid his eyes on me, and one of my colleagues moved in to arrest him. His smile faded. Were you expecting someone else? A client for your illicit practices, perhaps? <laughs> I scoffed, the stains on his apron and hands telling an ugly tale. What is the meaning of this? What's going on? I'll have your badges, all of you! He cried, genuinely upset that we barged in, as if what he was doing was perfectly normal. I took a couple steps closer, his current project still obscured from view. Well, Mosley, you're going away for a long, long time. We met a little while ago. I'm Sheriff Erickson. We did a little trade, and you gave up something you shouldn't have. I held out the talisman and saw his eyes glimmer. This town might have some odd practices, Waylon, but criminals are always the same when it comes to getting what they want. Predictable. I leaned down and grabbed his jaw with my hand, wanting him to feel the power I had. That I could break his jaw, or rip out his tongue, or snap his neck if I so wished. Now, where is my deputy? Where is Willis? He wrestled against the officers, but was no match and simply grunted before looking back at me, confused and angry. What deputy? You sold me a pristine table! I felt my grip on his mouth tighten and I let go, slapping him as hard as I could. Don't you play with me, son. You inspected him, you paid for him, and took him away by hand. I watched you do it. Now I ain't gonna ask you nicely again. Where is he? I will never forget the sequence of events that followed, even if I would give anything to do so. His pupils dilated, and the eyes moved to the table hidden under the top. As I followed them, I felt the world fall away as a single question came into my mind. One I knew the answer to already. Why were all the cages empty? I repeated that question over and over as I slowly walked to the top, another officer finding the light switch at the same time and illuminating the whole room. Screams and guttural wretches filled the space as we saw what was in this room of nightmares. What was under the top? Something did indeed sit there, but it wasn't pristine. It wasn't a table. It was Willis. His skin was stretched to the point that a single tap or scratch, and I knew it had split open. Translucent and thick veins, visible like a macabre pattern you'd found on a mahogany table, his limbs acting as horrible legs, the bones broken and reset to fit, his feet and hands turned into malformed stumps. The sockets where his eyes lay now nothing more than cup holders, his mouth agape and air escaping it. I don't know how Waylon did it. I don't want to know how he did it. But I swear to God I felt life within Willis. Something in him was still conscious. A soft wheeze escaped him. Faint, but defiant. Mercy. 
RC. My baby brother. I couldn't imagine his suffering. I just sobbed and screamed. As we took in the surrounding room, it was apparent the rest of the furniture wasn't swaying, twitching, or undulating. It was all still alive. It was people. Poor, unfortunate people Waylon had entrapped and redesigned using his master craftsman technique, making them into his living, bespoke furniture of horrors. And that was the part that terrified me the most. We hauled him away. The entire time he protested his innocence, that he was simply acquiring old furniture and restoring it. He also insisted someone had set fire to the building, and he was outside when we apprehended him. I don't know if he was mentally trying to distance himself from what he'd done, removing his past deeds somehow. But I don't fucking care. I had to tell Willis' wife what had happened to him. I lied and said Wayland simply killed him and dumped his body when he found out he wasn't useful. I couldn't bear them knowing he was a part of Wayland's furniture. Not even after the news got out. We'd find out as time went on who some of the victims were. An ex-girlfriend here, an old dorm room buddy there, a couple of travelers he'd taken in, and several missing persons from the entertainment district. All in all, we'd found nearly a dozen missing persons in his home. A lot of families would get both closure and add new nightmares to their suffering at the same time. We interrogated Waylon for three straight days, but not once did he break his mentality that what he'd done was wrong. He genuinely did not see any of his victims as people, but as furniture for him to save. After that final interrogation, I wanted to hand in my badge after Wayland's sentencing, leave Sturgeon, and settle down somewhere quiet. I couldn't face both his last words and the recollection of our first call with him, and what it meant for the wider consequences. But it was that feeling that made me stay, to catch the next embodiment of evil before he or she strikes. You see, Wayland was very forthright with his business explaining that he did in fact sell on most of his pieces to wealthy clients. Never asked details, just that they took care of his pieces and paid him appropriately so he could live his dream. He told us in that call he only kept the ones he connected with, like a true fucking freak. But it was that final response he gave before he was taken away that keeps me drinking, keeps my hands shaking, and a lifelong hatred of the evil this world houses. I will never forget the way his eyes lit up, the curling of his lips, or the way his tongue caressed his teeth when he replied. You see, we'd asked him if he was concerned about the fact that not only had one of his victims had gotten away before being twisted beyond recognition, ready to testify against him in an already ironclad case, but that Willis was able to speak in short, pain-racked sentences and give his own account. And that, if and when found guilty, he'd be given one of the worst punishments imaginable. I can still hear his response in my ears every time I lay my head down, joining Willis's pain-riddled wheezes as a chorus of hatred and pain. It will haunt me for the rest of my fucking life. He said, no, because furniture doesn't talk. Listeners, ever since that video ended, I'm now feverishly looking around at my entire recording studio. It feels like the sound desk is breathing, my lamp is swaying, and the very walls themselves are oozing. Or maybe someone put something in my drink. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out some of our other transmissions. We're adding them regularly and we'd love to have you as part of the Dusklight family by subscribing, hitting the bell of furniture, and leave a comment with stories you'd love for my many-legged runners to find. And, one last time listeners, close your eyes and breathe with me. Remember, no matter how bad things are, how cruel people can be, and how heavy your shoulders may feel with the weight of the world bearing down on them, 
Dust Cloud will always be here to lift the load and provide you with some respite. Drink some water, watch a video about tree frogs, eat something savory, and sleep on the cool side of the pillow with the window open and the stars twinkling down on you. Start and end each day with kindness in your heart. You matter, you are loved, and every day is another chance. I'll see you again when the sun sets and dusk enters the station.